Chapter 7 Create the Illusion of Control A month after I'd finished working the case of Jeffrey Schilling in May 2001, I got orders from headquarters to head back to Manila. The same bad guys who'd taken Schilling, a brutal group of radical Islamists named the Abu Sayyaf, had raided the Dos Palmas private diving resort and taken 20 hostages, including three Americans, Martin and Gracia Burnham, a missionary couple from Wichita, Kansas, and Guillermo Sabero, a guy who ran a California waterproofing firm. Dos Palmas was a negotiator's nightmare from the start. The day after the kidnappings, the recently elected Philippine president, Gloria Macapagalroyo, set up the most confrontational, non-constructive dynamic possible by publicly declaring all-out war on the Abu Sayyaf. Not exactly empathetic discourse, right? It got a lot worse. The Philippine army and marines had a turf war in the midst of the negotiations, pissing off the kidnappers with several botched raids. Because American hostages were involved, the CIA, the FBI, and U.S. military intelligence were all called in, and we too squabbled among ourselves. Then the kidnappers raped and killed several hostages, 9-11s happened, and the Abu Sayyaf was linked to al-Qaeda. By the time the crisis concluded in an orgy of gunshots in June 2002, Dos Palmas had officially become the biggest failure in my professional life. To call it a train wreck would be generous, if you know what I mean. But failures plant the seeds of future success, and our failure in the Philippines was no exception. If the Dos Palmas calamity showed me anything, it was that we all were still suffering under the notion that negotiation was a wrestling match, where the point is to exhaust your opponent into submission, hope for the best, and never back down. As my disappointment with Dos Palmas forced me to reckon with our failed techniques, I took a deep look into the newest negotiating theories some great, and some completely harebrained and I had a chance encounter with a case in Pittsburgh that completely changed how I looked at the interpersonal dynamics of negotiation conversations. From the ashes of Dos Palmas, then, we learned a lesson that would forever change how the FBI negotiated kidnappings. We learned that negotiation was coaxing, not overcoming, co-opting, not defeating most important, we learned that successful negotiation involved getting your counterpart to do the work for you and suggest your solution himself. It involved giving him the illusion of control while you, in fact, were the one defining the conversation. The tool we developed is something I call the calibrated or open-ended question. What it does is remove aggression from conversations by acknowledging the other side openly, without resistance. In doing so, it lets you introduce ideas and requests without sounding pushy. It allows you to nudge. I'll explain it in depth later on, but for now let me say that it's really as simple as removing the hostility from the statement you can leave and turning it into a question. What do you hope to achieve by going? Don't try to negotiate in a firefight. The moment I arrived in Manila on the Burnham Sabero case, I was sent down to the Mindanao region, where the Philippine military was lobbing bullets and rockets into a hospital complex, where the Abu Sayyaf and the hostages were holed up. This was no place for a negotiator, because it's impossible to have a dialogue in the middle of a firefight. Then things got worse. When I woke up the next morning, I learned that during the night the kidnappers had taken their hostages and escaped. The escape was the first sign that this operation was going to be a rolling train wreck, and that the Philippine military was less than a trustworthy partner. During debriefings following the episode, it was revealed that during a ceasefire a military guy had collected a suitcase from the thugs in the hospital, and not long after that all the soldiers on the rear perimeter of the hospital had been called away for a meeting. Coincidentally or not the bad guys chose that moment to slip away. Things really blew up two weeks later, on the Philippines' Independence Day, when Abu Sabay announced that he was going to behead one of the whites, unless the government called off its manhunt by midday. We knew this meant one of the Americans, and anticipated it would be Guillermo Sabero. We didn't have any direct contact with the kidnappers at the time because our partners in the Philippine military had assigned us an intermediary who always forgot to make sure we were present for his phone calls with the kidnappers, and similarly forgot to tape them. All we could do was send text messages offering to schedule a time to speak. What ended up happening was that just before the noon deadline, Sabayan, a member of the Philippine presidential cabinet, had a conversation on a radio talk show, and the government conceded to Sabaya's demand to name a Malaysian senator as a negotiator. In exchange, Sabaya agreed not to kill a hostage, but it was too late to fix this atmosphere of confrontation, distrust, and lies. That afternoon, the hostages heard Sabaya on the phone yelling, but that was part of the agreement. That was a part of the agreement. Not long after, the Abu Sayyaf beheaded Guillermo Sabero, and for good measure the group took 15 more hostages. 
with none of the important moving parts anywhere near under our control and the United States largely uninterested in spite of Sabero's murder, I headed back to Washington, D.C. It seemed like there was little we could do, then 9-11s changed everything. Once a minor terrorist outfit, the Abu Sayyaf was suddenly linked to Al-Qaeda. And then a Philippine TV reporter named Arlen de la Cruz got into the Abu Sayyaf camp and videotaped Sabaya as he taunted the American missionaries Martin and Gracia Burnham, who were so emaciated they looked like concentration camp survivors. The video hit the U.S. news media like thunder. Suddenly, the case became a major U.S. government priority. There is always a team on the other side the FBI sent me back in. Now I was sent in to make sure a deal got made. It was all very high profile, too. Some of my contacts reported that FBI Director Robert Mueller was personally briefing President George W. Bush every morning on what we were doing. When Director Mueller showed up in the U.S. Embassy in Manila and I was introduced to him, a look of recognition came over his face. That was a very heady moment. But all the support in the world won't work if your counterpart's team is dysfunctional. If your negotiation efforts don't reach past your counterpart and into the team behind him, then you've got a hope-based deal and hope is not a strategy. One of the things I failed to fully appreciate then was that the kidnappers had changed negotiators themselves. Sabaya had been replaced. My boss Gary Nosner had, in a previous kidnapping, pointed out to me that a change in negotiators by the other side almost always signaled that they meant to take a harder line. What I didn't realize at the time was this meant Sabaya was going to play a role as a deal-breaker if he wasn't accounted for. Our new tack was to buy the Burnhams back. Although the United States officially doesn't pay ransoms, a donor had been found who would provide $300,000. The new Abu Sayyaf negotiator agreed to a release. The ransom drop was a disaster. The kidnappers decided that they wouldn't release the Burnhams. Or, rather, Sabaya, who was physically in charge of the hostages, refused to release them. He had cut his own side deal one we didn't know about and it had fallen through. The new negotiator, now embarrassed and in a foul mood, covered himself by claiming that the payment was short $600. We were baffled $600? You won't let hostages go because of $600? And, we tried to argue that if the money was missing, it must have been the courier who had stolen the money. But we had no dynamic of trust and cooperation to back us up. The $300,000 was gone and we were back to rarely answered text messages. The slow motion wreck culminated about two months later with a botched rescue. A team of Philippine scout rangers walking around in the woods came across the Abu Sayyaf camp, or so they said. Later we heard another government agency had tipped them off. That other government agency, OGA, had not told us about their location, because dot 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 because dot 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 why? That's something I will never understand. The scout rangers formed a skirmish line from a tree line above the camp and opened fire, indiscriminately pouring bullets into the area. Gracia and Martin were taking a nap in their hammocks when the fire started raining down. They both fell out of their hammocks and started to roll down the hill towards safety. But as a sheet of bullets from their rescuers fell on them, Gracia felt a searing burn flare through her right eye. And then, she fell Martin go limp. Minutes later, after the last rebels fled, the squad of Philippine soldiers tried to reassure Gracia that her husband was fine, but she shook her head. After a year in captivity, she had no time for fantasies. Gracia knew her husband was dead, and she was right. He'd been hit in the chest three times, by friendly fire. In the end, the supposed rescue mission killed two of the three hostages there that day, a Philippine nurse named Edaboriap also died, and the big fish Sabaya escaped to live a few more months. From beginning to end, the 13-month mission was a complete failure, a waste of lives and treasure. As I sat in the dark at home a few days later, dispirited and spent, I knew that something had to change. We couldn't let this happen again. If the hostages' deaths were going to mean something, we would have to find a new way to negotiate, communicate, listen, and speak, both with our enemies and with our friends. Not for communication's sake, though. No. We had to do it to win. Avoid a showdown no two ways about it, my return to the United States was a time of reckoning. I questioned I even doubted some of what we were doing at the FBI. If what we knew wasn't enough, we had to get better. The real kick in the pants came after my return, when I was reviewing information about the case, a lot of which we hadn't had in the field. Among the piles of information was one fact that totally blew my mind. Martin Burnham had been overheard on a phone call to someone. I wondered what in God's name our hostage was doing talking on the phone without us knowing. And with whom was he talking? 
There's only one reason a hostage ever gets on a phone. It's to provide proof of life. Someone else had been trying to ransom the Burnhams out. It turned out to be someone working for a crooked Philippine politician who'd been running a parallel negotiation for the Burnham's release. He wanted to buy the hostages out himself in order to show up Philippine President Arroyo. But it wasn't so much that this guy was going behind our backs that bothered me. As is pretty clear already, there were a whole lot of underhanded things going on. What really aided me was that this schmuck, who wasn't an FI trained hostage negotiator, had pulled off something that I hadn't been able to. He gotten to speak to Martin Burnham on the phone. For free. That's when I realized that this crooked pole success where we had failed was a kind of metaphor for everything that was wrong with our one-dimensional mincet. Beyond our problems with the Philippine military, the big reason we had no effective influence with the kidnappers and hostages was that we had this very tit-for-tat mentality. Under that mentality, if we called up the bad guys we were asking for something, and if they gave it to us we had to give them something back. And so, because we were positive that the Burnhams were alive, we never bothered to call and ask for proof of life. We were afraid to go into debt. If we made an ask and they granted it, we'd owe. Not making good on a debt risk the accusation of bad faith negotiation and bad faith in kidnappings gets people killed. And of course we didn't ask the kidnappers to talk directly to the hostage because we knew they'd say no and we were afraid of being embarrassed. That fear was a major flaw in our negotiating mincet. There is some information that you can only get through direct extended interactions with your counterpart. We also needed new ways to get things without asking for them. We needed to finesse making an ask with something more sophisticated than closed-ended questions with their yes-no dynamic. That's when I realized that what we had been doing wasn't communication, it was verbal flexing. We wanted them to see things our way and they wanted us to see it their way. If you let this dynamic loose in the real world, negotiation breaks down and tensions flare. That whole ethos permeated everything the FBI was doing. Everything was a showdown. And it didn't work. Our approach to proof of life questions embodied all these problems. At the time, we proved that our hostages were alive by devising questions that ask for a piece of information only the hostage could know. Computer security style questions like, what's the name of Martin's first dog? Or what's Martin's dad's middle name? This particular type of question had many failings, however. For one thing, it had sort of become a signature of law enforcement in the kidnapping world. When a family starts asking a question of that type, it's a near certainty that the cops are coaching them. And that makes kidnappers very nervous. Even beyond the nerves, you had the problem that answering questions like those required little, if any, effort. The bad guys go and get the fact and give it to you right away, because it's so easy. Bang, bang, bang. It happened so fast that you didn't gain any tactical advantage, any usable information, any effort on their part toward a goal that serves you. And all negotiation, done well, should be an information-gathering process that vests your counterpart in an outcome that serves you. Worst of all, the bad guys know that they have just given you something a proof of life which triggers this whole human reciprocity gene. Whether we like to recognize it or not, a universal rule of human nature, across all cultures, is that when somebody gives you something, they expect something in return. And they won't give anything else until you pay them back. Now, we didn't want to trigger this whole reciprocity thing because we didn't want to give anything. So what happened? All of our conversations became these paralyzed confrontations between two parties who wanted to extract something from each other, but didn't want to give. We didn't communicate, out of pride and fear. That's why we failed, while numbskulls like this crooked Philippine politician just stumbled in and got what we so desperately needed, that is, communication without reciprocity. I sat back and wondered to myself, how the hell do we do that? Suspend unbelief while I was racking my brains over how this sleazy politician managed to get Martin Burnham on the phone while we never could, FBI Pittsburgh had a kidnapping case. My partner Chuck brought me the tapes from the case because he thought it was funny. You see, one Pittsburgh drug dealer had kidnapped the girlfriend of another Pittsburgh drug dealer, and for whatever reason the victim drug dealer came to the FBI for help. Coming to the FBI seemed kind of contrary to his best interests, being a drug dealer and all, but he did it because no matter who you are, when you need help you go to the FBI, right? On the tapes, our hostage negotiators are riding around with this drug dealer while he's negotiating with the other drug dealer. Normally we would have had the guy ask a bulletproof proof-of-life question, like, what was the name of the girlfriend's teddy bear when she was little? But in this situation, this drug dealer hadn't yet been coached on asking a correct question. 
So in the middle of the conversation with the kidnapper, he just blurts, hey, dog, how do I know she's all right? And the funniest thing happened. The kidnapper actually went silent for 10 seconds. He was completely taken aback. Then he said, in a much less confrontational tone of voice, well, I'll put her on the phone. I was floored because this unsophisticated drug dealer just pulled off a phenomenal victory in the negotiation. To get the kidnapper to volunteer to put the victim on the phone is massively huge. That's when I had my holy shit moment and realized that this is the technique I'd been waiting for. Instead of asking some closed-ended question with a single correct answer, he'd asked an open-ended yet calibrated one that forced the other guy to pause and actually think about how to solve the problem. I thought to myself, this is perfect. It's a natural and normal question, not a request for a fact. It's a how question, and how engages because how asks for help. Best of all, he doesn't owe the kidnapper a damn thing. The guy volunteers to put the girlfriend on the phone. He thinks it's his idea. The guy who just offered to put the girlfriend on the line thinks he's in control. And the secret to gaining the upper hand in a negotiation is giving the other side the illusion of control. The genius of this technique is really well explained by something that the psychologist Kevin Dutton says in his book Split Second Persuasion. One, he talks about what he calls unbelief, which is active resistance to what the other side is saying, complete rejection. That's where the two parties in a negotiation usually start. If you don't ever get off that dynamic, you end up having showdowns, as each side tries to impose its point of view. You get two hard skulls banging against each other, like in Dos Palmas. But if you can get the other side to drop their unbelief, you can slowly work them to your point of view on the back of their energy, just like the drug dealer's question got the kidnapper to volunteer to do what the drug dealer wanted. You don't directly persuade them to see your ideas. Instead, you ride them to your ideas. As the saying goes, the best way to ride a horse is in the direction in which it is going. Our job as persuaders is easier than we think. It's not to get others believing what we say. It's just to stop them unbelieving. Once we achieve that, the game's half won. Unbelief is the friction that keeps persuasion in check and says, without it, there'd be no limits. Giving your counterpart the illusion of control by asking calibrated questions, by asking for help is one of the most powerful tools for suspending unbelief. Not long ago, I read this great article in the New York Times 2 by a medical student who was faced with a patient who had ripped out his IV, packed his bags, and was making a move to leave because his biopsy results were days late and he was tired of waiting. Just then a senior physician arrived. After calmly offering the patient a glass of water and asking if they could chat for a minute, he said he understood why the patient was pissed off and promised to call the lab to see why the results were delayed. But what he did next is what really suspended the patient's unbelief. He asked a calibrated question what he felt was so important about leaving and then, when the patient said he had errands to handle, the doctor offered to connect the patient with services that could help him get them done. And boom, the patient volunteered to stay. What's so powerful about the senior doctor's technique is that he took what was a showdown I'm going to leave versus you can leave and asked questions that led the patient to solve his own problem dot 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 in the way the doctor wanted. It was still a kind of showdown, of course, but the doctor took the confrontation and bravado out of it by giving the patient the illusion of control. As an old Washington Post editor named Robert Estabrook once said, he who has learned to disagree without being disagreeable has discovered the most valuable secret of negotiation. This same technique for suspending unbelief that you use with kidnappers and escaping patients works for anything, even negotiating prices. When you go into a store, instead of telling the sales clerk what you need you can describe what you're looking for and ask for suggestions. Then, once you've picked out what you want, instead of hitting them with a hard offer, you can just say the price is a bit more than you budgeted and ask for help with one of the greatest of all time calibrated questions. How am I supposed to do that? The critical part of this approach is that you really are asking for help and your delivery must convey that. With this negotiating scheme, instead of bullying the clerk, you're asking for their advice and giving them the illusion of control. Asking for help in this manner, after you've already been engaged in a dialogue, is an incredibly powerful negotiating technique for transforming encounters from confrontational showdowns into joint problem-solving sessions, and calibrated questions are the best tool. Calibrate your questions a few years ago, I was consulting with a client who had a small firm that did public relations for a large corporation. The folks at the big company were not paying their bills, and as time went on, they owed my client more and more money. 
They kept her on the hook by promising lots of repeat business, implying that she would get a pile of revenue if she just kept working. She felt trapped. My advice for her was simple. I told her to engage them in a conversation where she summarized the situation and then asked, how am I supposed to do that? She shook her head. No way. The idea of having to ask this question just terrified her. If they tell me I have to, then I'm trapped? Was her reaction. She also heard the question as you're screwing me out of money, and it has to stop. That sounded like the first step to her getting fired as a consultant. I explained to her that this implication, though real, was in her mind. Her client would hear the words and not the implication, as long as she kept calm and avoided making it sound by her delivery like an accusation or threat. As long as she stayed cool, they would hear it as a problem to be solved. She didn't quite believe me. We walked through the script several times, but she was still afraid. Then a few days later she called me, totally giddy with happiness. The client had called with another request, and she had finally gotten up the courage to summarize the situation and ask, how am I supposed to do that? And you know what? The answer she got was you're right, you can't and I apologize. Her client explained that they were going through some internal problems, but she was given a new accounting contact and told she'd be paid within 48 hours. And she was. Now, think about how my client's question worked. Without accusing them of anything, it pushed the big company to understand her problem and offer the solution she wanted. That in a nutshell is the whole point of open-ended questions that are calibrated for a specific effect. Like the softening words and phrases perhaps maybe I think and it seems, the calibrated open-ended question takes the aggression out of a confrontational statement or close-ended request that might otherwise anger your counterpart. What makes them work is that they are subject to interpretation by your counterpart instead of being rigidly defined. They allow you to introduce ideas and requests without sounding overbearing or pushy. And that's the difference between you're screwing me out of money and it has to stop and how am I supposed to do that? The real beauty of calibrated questions is the fact that they offer no target for attack like statements do. Calibrated questions have the power to educate your counterpart on what the problem is, rather than causing conflict by telling them what the problem is. But calibrated questions are not just random requests for comment. They have a direction. Once you figure out where you want a conversation to go, you have to design the questions that will ease the conversation in that direction, while letting the other guy think it's his choice to take you there. That's why I refer to these questions as calibrated questions. You have to calibrate them carefully, just like you would calibrate a gun sight or a measuring scale to target a specific problem. The good news is that there are rules for that. First off, calibrated questions avoid verbs or words like can, is, are, do, or does. These are closed-ended questions that can be answered with a simple yes or a no. Instead, they start with a list of words people know as reporters' questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Those words inspire your counterpart to think and then speak expansively. But let me cut the list even further. It's best to start with what, how, and sometimes why, nothing else. Who, when, and where will often just get your counterpart to share a fact without thinking. And why can backfire. Regardless of what language the word why is translated into, it's accusatory. There are very rare moments when this is to your advantage. The only time you can use why successfully is when the defensiveness that is created supports the change you are trying to get them to see. Why would you ever change from the way you've always done things and try my approach, is an example. Why would your company ever change from your long-standing vendor and choose our company, is another. As always, tone of voice, respectful and deferential, is critical. Otherwise, treat why like a burner on a hot stove, don't touch it. Having just two words to start with might not seem like a lot of ammunition, but trust me, you can use what and how to calibrate nearly any question. Does this look like something you would like? can become how does this look to you? Or what about this works for you? You can even ask, what about this doesn't work for you? And you'll probably trigger quite a bit of useful information from your counterpart. Even something as harsh as why did you do it? Can be calibrated to what caused you to do it? Which takes away the emotion and makes the question less accusatory. You should use calibrated questions early and often, and there are a few that you will find that you will use in the beginning of nearly every negotiation. What is the biggest challenge you face? is one of those questions. It just gets the other side to teach you something about themselves, which is critical to any negotiation because all negotiation is an information gathering process. Here are some other great standbys that I use in almost every negotiation, depending on the situation. What about this is important to you? How can I help to make this better for us? 
How would you like me to proceed? What is it that brought us into this situation? How can we solve this problem? What's the objective? What are we trying to accomplish here? How am I supposed to do that? The implication of any well-designed calibrated question is that you want what the other guy wants, but you need his intelligence to overcome the problem. This really appeals to very aggressive or egotistical counterparts. You've not only implicitly asked for help triggering goodwill and less defensiveness but, you've engineered a situation in which your formerly recalcitrant counterpart is now using his mental and emotional resources to overcome your challenges. It is the first step in your counterpart internalizing your way and the obstacles in it as his own. And that guides the other party toward designing a solution. Your solution. Think back to how the doctor used calibrated questions to get his patient to stay. As his story showed, the key to getting people to see things your way is not to confront them on their ideas, you can leave, but to acknowledge their ideas openly, I understand why you're pissed off, and then guide them towards solving the problem, what do you hope to accomplish by leaving? Like I said before, the secret to gaining the upper hand in a negotiation is giving the other side the illusion of control. That's why calibrated questions are ingenious. Calibrated questions make your counterpart feel like they're in charge, but it's really you who are framing the conversation. Your counterpart will have no idea how constrained they are by your questions. Once I was negotiating with one of my FBI bosses about attending a Harvard executive program. He had already approved the expenditure for the travel, but on the day before I was supposed to leave, he called me into his office and began to question the validity of the trip. I knew him well enough to know that he was trying to show me that he was in charge. So after we talked for a while, I looked at him and asked, when you originally approved this trip, what did you have in mind? He visibly relaxed as he sat back in his chair and brought the top of his fingers and thumbs together in the shape of a steeple. Generally this is a body language that means the person feels superior and in charge. Listen he said, just make sure you brief everyone when you get back. That question, calibrated to acknowledge his power and nudge him toward explaining himself, gave him the illusion of control. And it got me just what I wanted. How not to get paid let's pause for a minute here, because there's one vitally important thing you have to remember when you enter a negotiation armed with your list of calibrated questions. That is, all of this is great, but there's a rub. Without self-control and emotional regulation, it doesn't work. The very first thing I talk about when I'm training new negotiators is the critical importance of self-control. If you can't control your own emotions, how can you expect to influence the emotions of another party? To show you what I mean, let me tell you a story. Not long ago, a freelance marketing strategist came to me with a problem. One of her clients had hired a new CEO, a penny pincher whose strategy was to cut costs by offshoring everything he could. He was also a male chauvinist who didn't like the assertive style in which the strategist, a woman, conducted herself. Immediately my client and the CEO started to go at each other on conference calls in that passive-aggressive way that is ever-present in corporate America. After a few weeks of this, my client decided she'd had enough and invoiced the CEO for the last bit of work she'd done, about $7,000, and politely said that the arrangement wasn't working out. The CEO answered by saying the bill was too high, that he'd pay half of it, and that they would talk about the rest. After that, he stopped answering her calls. The underlying dynamic was that this guy didn't like being questioned by anyone, especially a woman. So she and I developed a strategy that showed him she understood where she went wrong and acknowledged his power, while at the same time directing his energy towards solving her problem. The script we came up with hit all the best practices of negotiation we've talked about so far. Here it is by steps. 1. A no-oriented email question to reinitiate contact. Have you given up on settling this amicably? 2. A statement that leaves only the answer of that's right to form a dynamic of agreement. It seems that you feel my bill is not justified. 3. Calibrated questions about the problem to get him to reveal his thinking. How does this bill violate our agreement? 4. More no-oriented questions to remove unspoken barriers. Are you saying I misled you? Are you saying I didn't do as you asked? Are you saying I reneged on our agreement? Or are you saying I fail you? 5. Labeling and mirroring the essence of his answers if they are not acceptable so he has to consider them again. It seems like you feel my work was subpar. Or, dot dot my work was subpar. 6. A calibrated question and reply to any offer other than full payment, in order to get him to offer a solution. How am I supposed to accept that? 7. If none of this gets an offer of full payment, a label that flatters his sense of control and power. 
It seems like you are the type of person who prides himself on the way he does business rightfully so and has a knack for not only expanding the pie, but making the ship run more efficiently. 8. A long pause and then one more no-oriented question. Do you want to be known as someone who doesn't fulfill agreements? From my long experience in negotiation, scripts like this have a 90% success rate. That is, if the negotiator stays calm and rational. And that's a big if. In this case, she didn't. The first step the magic email worked better than she imagined, and the CEO called within 10 minutes, surprising her. Almost immediately her anger flared at the sound of his patronizing voice. Her only desire became to show him how he was wrong, to impose her will, and the conversation became a showdown that went nowhere. You probably don't need me to tell you that she didn't even get half. With that in mind, I want to end this chapter with some advice on how to remain rational in a negotiation. Even with all the best techniques and strategy, you need to regulate your emotions if you want to have any hope of coming out on top. The first and most basic rule of keeping your emotional cool is to bite your tongue. Not literally, of course. But you have to keep away from knee-jerk passionate reactions. Pause. Think. Let the passion dissipate. That allows you to collect your thoughts and be more circumspect in what you say. It also lowers your chance of saying more than you want to. The Japanese have this figured out. When negotiating with a foreigner, it's common practice for a Japanese businessman to use a translator, even when he understands perfectly what the other side is saying. That's because speaking through a translator forces him to step back. It gives him time to frame his response. Another simple rule is, when you are verbally assaulted, do not counterattack. Instead, disarm your counterpart by asking a calibrated question. The next time a waiter or sales clerk tries to engage you in a verbal skirmish, try this out. I promise you it will change the entire tenor of the conversation. The basic issue here is that when people feel that they are not in control, they adopt what psychologists call a hostage mentality. That is, in moments of conflict they react to their lack of power by either becoming extremely defensive or lashing out. Neurologically, in situations like this the fight-or-flight mechanism in the reptilian brain or the emotions in the limbic system overwhelm the rational part of our mind, the neocortex, leading us to overreact in an impulsive instinctive way. In a negotiation, like in the one between my client and the CEO, this always produces a negative outcome. So we have to train our neocortex to override the emotions from the other two brains. That means biting your tongue and learning how to mindfully change your state to something more positive. And it means lowering the hostage mentality in your counterpart by asking a question or even offering an apology. You're right. That was a bit harsh. If you were able to take an armed kidnapper who'd been surrounded by police and hook him up to a cardiac monitor, you'd find that every calibrated question and apology would lower his heart rate just a little bit. And that's how you get to a dynamic where solutions can be found. Key lessons who has control in a conversation, the guy listening or the guy talking. The listener, of course. That's because the talker is revealing information while the listener, if he's trained well, is directing the conversation toward his own goals. He's harnessing the talker's energy for his own ends. When you try to work the skills from this chapter into your daily life, remember that these are listener's tools. They are not about strong-arming your opponent into submission. Rather, they're about using the counterpart's power to get to your objective. They're listener's judo. As you put listener's judo into practice, remember the following powerful lessons. Don't try to force your opponent to admit that you are right. Aggressive confrontation is the enemy of constructive negotiation. Avoid questions that can be answered with yes or tiny pieces of information. These require little thought and inspire the human need for reciprocity. You will be expected to give something back. Ask calibrated questions that start with the words how or what. By implicitly asking the other party for help, these questions will give your counterpart an illusion of control and will inspire them to speak at length, revealing important information. Don't ask questions that start with why unless you want your counterpart to defend a goal that serves you. Why is always an accusation, in any language. Calibrate your questions to point your counterpart towards solving your problem. This will encourage them to expend their energy on devising a solution. Bite your tongue. When you're attacked in a negotiation, pause and avoid angry emotional reactions. Instead, ask your counterpart a calibrated question. There is always a team on the other side. If you are not influencing those behind the table, you are vulnerable. Chapter 8 Guarantee Execution During a Dangerous and Chaotic Prison Siege in St. Martin Parish, Louisiana, a few years ago, a group of inmates armed with makeshift knives took the warden and some of his staff hostage. 
The situation was especially nervy because the prisoners were both tense and disorganized, a worrisome mix that meant anything could happen. The negotiators sensed that, beneath the bluster, the prisoners didn't really want to hurt the staff. They knew that they fell backed into a corner and, more than anything, they wanted the situation to end. But there was a stumbling block. The inmates were afraid that the prisoners who gave up after taking correctional officers hostage, not to mention the warden, would end up beaten, and badly. So the negotiators delivered a pair of walkie-talkies to the inmates and designed this elaborate surrender ritual to get the hostage takers to end the siege. The idea was elegantly simple. The inmates would send out one of their guys with a walkie-talkie, and he'd walk past the three perimeters of combined multi-agency law enforcement that were stationed outside the prison. Once he'd walk past the final perimeter, he'd get into the paddy wagon and be transferred to jail. There, he'd use the walkie-talkie to call the guys back in the prison and say, essentially, they didn't kick my ass, and they'd know it was okay to come out just like he did, one at a time. After some haggling, the inmates agreed with the plan, and the first inmate comes out. It starts off great. He walks past the federal zone, then the SWAT zone, and then he makes it to the outer perimeter. But just as he's about to climb into the paddy wagon, some guy sees the walkie-talkie and says, what the hell are you doing with that? And confiscates it before sending the guy off to the jail. The inmates back in the prison start to freak out because their buddy hasn't called. The one with the other walkie-talkie calls the negotiators and starts yelling, why didn't he call? They're kicking his ass. We told you. He starts talking about cutting off a hostage's finger, just to make sure the negotiators know the inmates are for real. Now it's the negotiators who are freaking out. They sprint to the perimeter and start screaming at everyone. It's life and death at stake, or at least an amputated finger. Finally, 15 nail-biting minutes later, this SWAT guy comes striding up, all proud of himself. Some idiot gave this dude a radio he says, and sort of smiles as he hands the negotiators the walkie-talkie. The negotiators barely stop themselves from slugging the guy before they tear off to the jail to have the first inmate call in. Crisis averted, but barely. The point here is that your job as a negotiator isn't just to get to an agreement. It's getting to one that can be implemented and making sure that happens. Negotiators have to be decision architects. They have to dynamically and adaptively design the verbal and nonverbal elements of the negotiation to gain both consent and execution. Yes is nothing without how. While an agreement is nice, a contract is better, and a signed check is best. You don't get your profits with the agreement. They come upon implementation. Success isn't the hostage taker saying, yes, we have a deal. Success comes afterward when the freed hostage says to your face, thank you. In this chapter, I'll show how to drive toward and achieve consent, both with those at the negotiating table and with the invisible forces underneath it, distinguish true buy-in from fake acquiescence, and guarantee execution using the rule of three. Yes is nothing without how about a year after the Dos Palmas crisis, I was teaching at the FBI Academy in Quantico when the Bureau got an urgent call from the State Department. An American had been kidnapped in the Ecuadorian jungle by a Colombia-based rebel group. As the FBI's lead international hostage negotiator, this was my baby, so I put a team together and set up Operation Headquarters in Quantico. For a few years, Jose and his wife, Julie, had been guiding tour groups through the jungle near the Colombian border. Born in Ecuador, Jose had become an American citizen and was working as a paramedic in New York City when he and Julie decided to set up an ecotourism business in his native country. Jose loved the Ecuadorian jungle, and he'd long dreamed of teaching visitors about the monkeys that swung through the trees and the flowers that perfumed the trails. The business grew as Ecuador's fell for the pair's obvious passion, and on August 20, 2003, Jose and Julie took 11 people on a whitewater rafting trip down the Mira River. After a great day on the water, everyone was smiling and soaked as they piled into jeeps and pickups for the ride to an inn in a nearby village. Jose told tall tales as he drove the lead truck, Julie to his right with their 11-month-old baby in her lap. They were five minutes from the inn when three men jumped into the road and aimed guns at the truck. A fourth man emerged and held a revolver to Julie's head as the thugs pulled Jose from the car and forced him into the truck bed. The kidnappers then ordered the caravan through several small towns to a fork in the road, where they got out and walked Jose past Julie's seat in the cab. Just remember Julie said, no matter what happens, I love you. Don't worry. I'll be fine, Jose answered. And then he and his captors disappeared into the jungle. The captors wanted five million dollars. We wanted to buy time. 
Ever since the Dos Palmas debacle and the Pittsburgh epiphany, I had been raring to employ the lessons we'd learned about calibrated questions. So when Jose was kidnapped, I sent my guys down to Ecuador and told them that we had a new strategy. The kidnapping would provide an opportunity to prove this approach. All we are going to say is, hey, how do we know Jose is okay? How are we supposed to pay until we know Jose is okay? Again and again I told them. Although they were queasy about untested techniques, my guys were game. The local cops were livid, though, because they always did proof of life the old-fashioned way, which the FBI had taught them in the first place. Luckily Julie was with us 100% because she saw how the calibrated questions would stall for time, and she was convinced that with enough time her husband would find a way to get home. The day after the kidnapping, the rebels marched Jose into the mountains along the Colombian border and settled in a cabin high in the jungle. There Jose built a rapport with the kidnappers to make himself harder for them to kill. He impressed them with his knowledge of the jungle and, with a black belt in karate, he filled the time by teaching them martial arts. My negotiators coached Julie every day as we waited for contact from the rebels. We learned later that the designated negotiator from Jose's captors had to walk to town to negotiate by phone. My guys told Julie to answer every one of the kidnappers' demands with a question. My strategy was to keep the kidnappers engaged but off balance. How do I know Jose is alive? She asked the first time they talked. To their demand for $5 million, she said, we don't have that kind of money. How can we raise that much? How can we pay you anything until we know Jose is okay? Julie asked the next time they talked. Questions, always questions. The kidnapper who was negotiating with Julie seemed extremely perplexed by her persistent questions, and he kept asking for time to think. That slowed everything down, but he never got angry with Julie. Answering questions gave him the illusion that he had control of the negotiation. By constantly asking questions and making minuscule offers, Julie drove the ransom down to $16,500. When they came to that number, the kidnappers demanded she get it to them immediately. How can I do that when I have to sell my cars and trucks? She asked, always buying more time. We were starting to grin because success was within reach. We were really close to a ransom that the family could afford. And then I got a phone call in the middle of the night from one of my deployed guys in Ecuador, Kevin Rust. Kevin is a terrific negotiator and the same guy who'd called to tell me a year earlier that Martin Burnham had been killed. My stomach tied into a knot when I heard his voice. We just got a call from Jose, Kevin said. He's still in guerrilla territory, but he escaped and he's on a bus, and he's making his way out. It took me half a minute to respond, and when I did all I could say was holy shit, that's fantastic news. What had happened, we learned later, was that with all the delays and questions, some of the guerrillas peeled off and didn't return. Pretty soon there was only one teenager guarding Jose at night. He saw an opening late one evening when it began to chuck down rain. Pounding on the metal roof, the rain drowned out all other sound as the lone guard slept. Knowing the wet leaves outside would absorb the sound of his footsteps, Jose climbed through the window, ran down jungle paths to a dirt road, and worked his way to a small town. Two days later he was back with Julie and their baby, just a few days before his daughter's first birthday. Julie was right. With enough time he had found a way home. Calibrated how questions are a surefire way to keep negotiations going. They put the pressure on your counterpart to come up with answers and to contemplate your problems when making their demands. With enough of the right how questions you can read and shape the negotiating environment in such a way that you'll eventually get to the answer you want to hear. You just have to have an idea of where you want the conversation to go when you're devising your questions. The trick to how questions is that, correctly used, they are gentle and graceful ways to say no and guide your counterpart to develop a better solution your solution. A gentle how no invites collaboration and leaves your counterpart with a feeling of having been treated with respect. Look back at what Julie did when the Colombian rebel kidnappers made their first demands. How can we raise that much? She asked. Notice that she did not use the word no. But she still managed to elegantly deny the kidnappers $5 million demand. As Julie did, the first and most common no question you'll use is some version of how am I supposed to do that? For example, how can we raise that much? Your tone of voice is critical as this phrase can be delivered as either an accusation or a request for assistance. So pay attention to your voice. This question tends to have the positive effect of making the other side take a good look at your situation.
This positive dynamic is what I refer to as forced empathy, and it's especially effective if leading up to it, you've already been empathic with your counterpart. This engages the dynamic of reciprocity to lead them to do something for you. Starting with Jose's kidnapping, how am I supposed to do that? Became our primary response to a kidnapper demanding a ransom. And we never had it backfire. Once I was working with an accounting consultant named Kelly who was owed a pile of money by a corporate client. She kept consulting because she believed she was developing a useful contact and because the promise of a future payday seemed to justify continuing in good faith. But at a certain point Kelly was so far behind on her own bills that she was in a bind. She couldn't continue to work with only a vague idea of when she'd get paid, but she worried that if she pushed too hard she wouldn't get paid at all. I told her to wait until the client asked for more work because if she made a firm payment demand right away she would be vulnerable if they refused. Luckily for Kelly, the client soon called to ask her for more work. Once he finished his request, she calmly asked a how question. I'd love to help, she said, but how am I supposed to do that? By indicating her willingness to work but asking for help finding a way to do so, she left her deadbeat customer with no choice but to put her needs ahead of everything else. And she got paid. Besides saying no the other key benefit of asking how? is quite literally that it forces your counterpart to consider and explain how a deal will be implemented. A deal is nothing without good implementation. Poor implementation is the cancer that eats your profits. By making your counterparts articulate implementation in their own words, you're carefully calibrated how questions will convince them that the final solution is their idea. And that's crucial. People always make more effort to implement a solution when they think it's theirs. That is simply human nature. That's why negotiation is often called the art of letting someone else have your way. There are two key questions you can ask to push your counterparts to think they are defining success their way. How will we know we're on track? And how will we address things if we find we're off track? When they answer, you summarize their answers until you get a that's right. Then you'll know they've bought in. On the flip side, be wary of two telling signs that your counterpart doesn't believe the idea is theirs. As I've noted, when they say, you're right, it's often a good indicator they are not vested in what is being discussed. And when you push for implementation and they say, I'll try, you should get a sinking feeling in your stomach, because this really means, I plan to fail. When you hear either of these, dive back in with calibrated how questions until they define the terms of successful implementation in their own voice. Follow up by summarizing what they have said together that's right. Let the other side feel victory. Let them think it was their idea. Subsume your ego. Remember, yes is nothing without how. So keep asking how and succeed. Influencing those behind the table a few weeks after Jose got back to the United States, I drove to his family's place in upstate New York. I was thrilled when Jose escaped, but the case left me with one nagging worry. Had my new strategy failed? You see, Jose had gotten home safely, but not because we'd negotiated his release. I worried that our winning had less to do with our brilliant strategy than with dumb luck. After being greeted warmly by Julie and her parents, Jose and I grabbed some coffee and sat down. I gone there to do what CNU referred to as a hostage survival debriefing. I was after insights into how to better advise people facing potential kidnappings how best to survive, not just physically, but psychologically. I was also burning to find out what had occurred behind the scenes, because it seemed as if my new strategy hadn't worked. Finally the conversation came around to our use of calibrated questions. You know what? He said. The craziest thing was that their negotiator was supposed to stay in town and negotiate the deal, but because Julie kept asking him questions, he didn't really know for sure how to answer. He kept coming out to the jungle. They all would get together and have a huge discussion about how to respond. They even thought about taking me into town and putting me on the phone, because Julie was so persistent with asking how did she know if I was okay. Right then I knew we had the right tool. It was exactly the opposite of the Burnham case, where our negotiator cut the deal with one of the guys, and then the rest of them took the $300,000 and said, no, we are not doing that. Causing the other side to work that hard and forcing that much internal coordination in service of our own goals was unprecedented. Our negotiating strategy in Ecuador worked not just because the questions contributed to the environment that let Jose escape, but because they made sure the kidnappers our counterparts were all on the same page. Yes, few hostage takers and few business deal makers fly solo. But for the most part, there are almost always other players, people who can act as deal makers or deal killers. 
If you truly want to get to yes and get your deal implemented, you have to discover how to affect these individuals. When implementation happens by committee, the support of that committee is key. You always have to identify and unearth their motivations, even if you haven't yet identified each individual on that committee. That can be easy as asking a few calibrated questions, like how does this affect the rest of your team, or how on board are the people not on this call, or simply what do your colleagues see as their main challenges in this area. The larger concept I'm explaining here is that in any negotiation you have to analyze the entire negotiation space. When other people will be affected by what is negotiated and can assert their rights or power later on, it's just stupid to consider only the interests of those at the negotiation table. You have to be aware of behind the table are level 2 players that is, parties that are not directly involved, but who can help implement agreements they like and block ones they don't. You can disregard them even when you're talking to a CEO. There could always be someone whispering into his ear. At the end of the day, the deal killers often are more important than the deal makers. Think back to the prison siege. It was almost ruined because one bit player on our side was not totally on board. That's what our use of calibrated questions in Ecuador avoided, and that's why Jose's case was a home run. It only takes one bit player to screw up a deal. A few years into private practice I'd lost sight of the importance of assessing and influencing the hidden negotiation that happens behind the table, and I paid a substantial price. We were closing a deal with a big company in Florida that wanted negotiation training for one of its divisions. We'd been on the phone a bunch of times with the CEO and the head of HR, and they were both 100% gung-ho on our offering. We were elated we had what we thought was total buy-in from the top decision-makers for an incredibly lucrative deal. And then, as we were figuring out the small print, the deal fell off the table. It turns out that the head of the division that needed the training killed the deal. Maybe this guy felt threatened, slighted, or otherwise somehow personally injured by the notion that he and his people needed any training at all. A surprisingly high percentage of negotiations hinge on something outside dollars and cents, often having more to do with self-esteem, status, and other non-financial needs. We'll never know now. The point is, we didn't care until too late because we convinced ourselves that we were on the phone with the only decision-makers that mattered. We could have avoided all that had we asked a few calibrated questions, like, how does this affect everybody else? How on board is the rest of your team? How do we make sure that we deliver the right material to the right people? How do we ensure the managers of those we are training are fully on board? If we had asked questions like that, the CEO and HR head would have checked with this guy, maybe even brought him into the conversation. And saved us all a lot of pain. Spotting liars, dealing with jerks, and charming everyone else as a negotiator, you're going to run into guys who lie to your face and try to scare you into agreement. Aggressive jerks and serial fabricators come with the territory, and dealing with them is something you have to do. But learning how to handle aggression and identify falsehood is just part of a larger issue. That is, learning how to spot and interpret the subtleties of communication both verbal and nonverbal that reveal the mental states of your counterparts. Truly effective negotiators are conscious of the verbal, paraverbal, how it's said, and nonverbal communications that pervade negotiations and group dynamics and they know how to employ those subtleties to their benefit. Even changing a single word when you present options like using not lose instead of keep can unconsciously influence the conscious choices your counterpart makes. Here I want to talk about the tools you need to ID liars, disarm jerks, and charm everybody else. Of course, the open-ended how question is one of them may be the most important one but there are many more. Alastair Onglingswin was living in the Philippines when, one evening in 2004, he hailed a taxi and settled in for a long ride home from Manila's Green Hills Shopping Center. He dozed off. And he woke up in chains. Unfortunately for Alastair, the cabbie had a second business as a kidnapper. He kept a bottle of ether in his front seat, and when a target fell asleep he would drug him, imprison him, and ask for ransom. Within hours, the kidnapper used Alastair's phone to contact his girlfriend in New York. He demanded a daily payment to take care of Alastair, while he researched the family's wealth. It's okay if you don't pay, he said. I can always sell his organs in Saudi Arabia. Within 24 hours, I'd been charged with heading the negotiation from Quantico. Alastair's girlfriend was too nervous to handle the family side of the negotiation, and his mother, who lived in the Philippines, just wanted to accept any demand the kidnapper made. But Alastair's brother Aaron, in Manila, was different. He just got the idea of negotiation, and he accepted that Alastair might die, which would make him a better and more effective negotiator. 
Aaron and I set up an always-on phone line, and I became Aaron's guru on the other side of the world. Through the kidnapper's comments and demands, I saw that he was experienced and patient. As a token of his intentions, he offered to cut off one of Alastair's ears and send it to the family, along with a video of him severing the ear. The demand for the daily payment was clearly a trick to quickly drain the family of as much money as possible, while at the same time gauging their wealth. We had to figure out who this guy was. Was he a lone operator or part of a group? Did he plan on killing Alastair or not? And we had to do that before the family went broke. To get there, we were going to have to engage the kidnapper in a protracted negotiation. We were going to have to slow everything down. From Quantico, I loaded Aaron up with calibrated questions. I instructed him to keep peppering the violent jerk with how? How am I supposed to dot 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 how do we know dot 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 how can we dot 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 there is great power in treating jerks with deference. It gives you the ability to be extremely assertive to say no in a hidden fashion. How do we know if we pay you that you won't hurt Alastair? Aaron asked. In the Chinese martial art of Tai Kai, the goal is to use your opponent's aggressiveness against him to turn his offense into your way to defeat him. That's the approach we took with Alastair's kidnapper. We wanted to absorb his threats and wear him down. We made sure that even scheduling a call with us was complex. We delayed making email responses. Through all these tactics, we gained the upper hand while giving the kidnapper the illusion of control. He thought he was solving Aaron's problems while we were just reading him and wasting his time. You see, it's best not to go chin to chin with aggressiveness like that of Alastair's kidnapper, rather, default to using what and how questions to avoid making bids or adjusting your own negotiating position. Dodge and weave. Finally, following days of back and forth bargaining on the daily rate, Aaron got the kidnapper down to a token amount and agreed to deposit a portion of the funds in his bank account. After that partial payment was made, Aaron came up with the perfect way to non-confrontationally confront the cabbie with a calibrated when what question. When we run out of money, what will happen? Aaron asked. The kidnapper paused. It will be all right, he finally responded. Yes. Without realizing what he had just agreed to, our killer had just promised us he wouldn't hurt Alastair. A repetitive series of what and how questions can help you overcome the aggressive tactics of a manipulative adversary. As you can see in that last exchange, the kidnapper's protracted chats with Aaron had turned Aaron almost into a friend. Over time the kidnapper had become unguarded about spending time on the phone with his friend. Finally, the Philippine National Police investigators tracked the phone to a house and raided it. The kidnapper and Alastair were not there, but the kidnapper's wife was. She told the police about another house they owned. The police quickly raided the other house, freed Alastair, and arrested the kidnapper. There are plenty of other tactics, tools, and methods for using subtle verbal and nonverbal forms of communication to understand and modify the mental states of your counterpart. As I run through some of them here, I want you to take a moment to internalize each one. These are the kind of tools that can help observant negotiators hit home runs. The 738-55% rule in two famous studies on what makes us like or dislike somebody, one UCLA psychology professor Albert Morabian created the 738-55 rule. That is, only 7% of a message is based on the words, while 38% comes from the tone of voice and 55% from the speaker's body language and face. While these figures mainly relate to situations where we are forming an attitude about somebody, the rule nonetheless offers a useful ratio for negotiators. You see, body language and tone of voice not words are our most powerful assessment tools. That's why I'll often fly great distances to meet someone face to face, even when I can say much of what needs to be said over the phone. So how do you use this rule? First, pay very close attention to tone and body language to make sure they match up with the literal meaning of the words. If they don't align, it's quite possible that the speaker is lying or at least unconvinced. When someone's tone of voice or body language does not align with the meaning of the words they say, use labels to discover the source of the incongruence. Here's an example. You. So we agreed? Them. Yes. Dot, 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 you. I heard you say, yes, but it seemed like there was hesitation in your voice. Them. Oh, it's nothing really. You. No, this is important, let's make sure we get this right. Them, thanks, I appreciate it. This is the way to make sure your agreement gets implemented with no surprises. And your counterpart will be grateful. Your act of recognizing the incongruence and gently dealing with it through a label will make them feel respected. Consequently, your relationship of trust will be improved. 
The rule of three I'm positive that sometime in your life you've been involved in a negotiation where you got a yes that later turned out to be a no. Maybe the other party was lying to you, or maybe they were just engaged in wishful thinking. Either way, this is not an uncommon experience. This happens because there are actually three kinds of yes, commitment, confirmation, and counterfeit. As we discussed in Chapter 5, so many pushy salesmen try to trap their clients into the commitment yes that many people get very good at the counterfeit yes. One great tool for avoiding this trap is the rule of three. The rule of three is simply getting the other guy to agree to the same thing three times in the same conversation. It's tripling the strength of whatever dynamic you're trying to drill into at the moment. In doing so, it uncovers problems before they happen. It's really hard to repeatedly lie or fake conviction. When I first learned the skill, my biggest fear was how to avoid sounding like a broken record or coming off as really pushy. The answer, I learned, is to vary your tactics. The first time they agree to something or give you a commitment, that's number one. For number two you might label or summarize what they said so they answer, that's right, and no. Three could be a calibrated how or what question about implementation that asks them to explain what will constitute success, something like what do we do if we get off track, or the three times might just be the same calibrated question phrased three different ways, like what's the biggest challenge you faced, what are we up against here, what do you see as being the most difficult thing to get around. Either way, going at the same issue three times uncovers falsehoods, as well as the incongruences between words and body language we mentioned in the last section. So next time you're not sure your counterpart is truthful and committed, try it. The Pinocchio effect with Carlo Collodi's famous character Pinocchio, it was easy to tell when he was lying. You just had to watch the nose. It turns out that Collodi wasn't far off reality. Most people offer obvious telltale signs when they're lying. Not a growing nose, but close enough. In a study of the components of lying, two Harvard Business School professor Deepak Malhotra and his co-authors found that, on average, liars use more words than truth-tellers and use far more third-person pronouns. They start talking about him, her, it, one, they, and their rather than I, in order to put some distance between themselves and the lie. And they discover that liars tend to speak in more complex sentences in an attempt to win over their suspicious counterparts. It's what W.C. Fields meant when he talked about baffling someone with bullshit. The researchers dubbed this the Pinocchio effect because, just like Pinocchio's nose, the number of words grew along with the lie. People who are lying are, understandably, more worried about being believed, so they work harder too hard, as it were, at being believable. Pay attention to their usage of pronouns. The use of pronouns by a counterpart can also help give you a feel for their actual importance in the decision and implementation chains on the other side of the table. The more in love they are with I, me, and my, the less important they are. Conversely, the harder it is to get a first-person pronoun out of a negotiator's mouth, the more important they are. Just like in the Malhopra study where the liar is distancing himself from the lie in a negotiation, smart decision makers don't want to be cornered at the table into making a decision. They will defer to the people away from the table to keep from getting pinned down. Our cabriver kidnapper in the Philippines of Alastair Onglingswin used we they and them so rigorously early on in the kidnapping, I was convinced we were engaged with their leader. I just never knew how literally true it was until the rescue. In the Chase Manhattan Bank robbery from Chapter 2, the bank robber Chris Watts consistently talked out how dangerous the others were and how little influence he had on them, all a lie. The Chris discount people always talk about remembering and using, but not overusing, your counterpart's name in a negotiation. And that's important. The reality though is people are often tired of being hammered with their own name. The slick salesman trying to drive them to yes will hit them with it over and over. Instead, take a different tack and use your own name. That's how I get the Chris discount. Just as using Alastair's name with the kidnapper and getting him to use it back humanized the hostage and made it less likely he would be harmed, using your own name creates the dynamic of forced empathy. It makes the other side see you as a person. A few years ago I was in a bar in Kansas with a bunch of fellow FBI negotiators. The bar was packed, but I saw one empty chair. I moved toward it, but just as I got ready to sit the guy next to it said, don't even think about it. Why? I asked, and he said, because I'll kick your ass. He was big, burly, and already drunk, but look, I'm a lifelong hostage negotiator I gravitate toward tense situations that need mediation like a moth to the flame. I held out my hand to shake his and said, my name is Chris. 
the dude froze, and in the pause my fellow FBI guys moved in, patted him on the shoulders, and offered to buy him a drink. Turned out he was a Vietnam veteran at a particularly low point. He was in a packed bar where the entire world seemed to be celebrating. The only thing he could think of was to fight. But as soon as I became Chris everything changed. Now take that mincet to a financial negotiation. I was in an outlet mall a few months after the Kansas experience, and I picked out some shirts in one of the stores. At the front counter the young lady asked me if I wanted to join their frequent buyer program. I asked her if I got a discount for joining, and she said, no. So I decided to try another angle. I said in a friendly manner, my name is Chris. What's the Chris discount? She looked from the register, met my eyes, and gave a little laugh. I'll have to ask my manager, Kathy, she said, and turned to the woman who'd been standing next to her. Kathy, who'd heard the whole exchange, said, the best I can do is 10%. Humanize yourself. Use your name to introduce yourself. Say it in a fun, friendly way. Let them enjoy the interaction, too, and get your own special price. How to get your counterparts to bid against themselves like you saw Aaron and Julie do with their kidnappers, the best way to get your counterparts to lower their demands is to say no using how questions. These indirect ways of saying no won't shut down your counterpart the way a blunt pride piercing no would. In fact, these responses will sound so much like counterbids that your counterparts will often keep bidding against themselves. We've found that you can usually express no four times before actually saying the word. The first step in the no series is the old standby. How am I supposed to do that? You have to deliver it in a deferential way, so it becomes a request for help. Properly delivered, it invites the other side to participate in your dilemma and solve it with a better offer. After that, some version of your offer is very generous, I'm sorry, that just doesn't work for me as an elegant second way to say no. This well-tested response avoids making a counter-offer, and the use of generous nurtures your counterpart to live up to the word. The I'm sorry also softens the no and builds empathy. You can ignore the so-called negotiating experts who say apologies are always signs of weakness. Then you can use something like I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I just can't do that. It's a little more direct, and the can do that does great double duty. By expressing an inability to perform, it can trigger the other side's empathy toward you. I'm sorry, no is a slightly more succinct version for the fourth no. If delivered gently, it barely sounds negative at all. If you have to go further, of course, no is the last and most direct way. Verbally, it should be delivered with a downward inflection and a tone of regard, it's not meant to be no. One of my students, a guy named Jesus Bueno, wrote me not long ago to tell me an amazing story about how he'd use the multi-step no to help his brother Joaquin out of a sticky business situation. His brother and two friends had bought a cannabis grow shop franchise in northern Spain, where the cultivation of marijuana for personal use is legal. Joaquin and his partner, Bruno, each invested €20,000 in the business for a 46% stake, a minority partner invested another €3,500 for 8%. From the beginning, Joaquin and Bruno had a rocky relationship. Joaquin is an excellent salesman, while Bruno was more of a bookkeeper. The minority partner was also an excellent salesman, and he and Joaquin believed that growing sales was the correct strategy. That meant offering discounts for large orders and repeat customers, which Bruno disagreed with. Their plan spending on launching a website and expanding inventory also rubbed Bruno the wrong way. Then Bruno's wife became a problem as she started nagging Joaquin about how he should not spend so much on expansion and instead take more profits. One day, Joaquin was reviewing inventory purchases and noticed that some items they had ordered had not been placed on the store's shelves. He began searching for them online, and to his surprise, he found an eBay store set up with the wife's first name that was selling exactly those missing products. This started a huge argument between Bruno and Joaquin and soured their relationship. In the heat of the moment, Bruno told Joaquin that he was open to selling his shares because he felt the business risks they were taking were too large. So Joaquin consulted with his brother, my student Jesus. Because they believed that pressure from Bruno's wife was why he wanted to sell, Jesus helped Joaquin craft an empathy message around that. It seems like you are under a lot of pressure from your wife. Joaquin was also in the middle of a divorce, so they decided to use that to relate to the wife issues, and they prepared an accusation, audit I know you think I don't care about costs, and taking profits from the company in order to diffuse the negative energy and get Bruno talking.
they work like a charm. Bruno immediately agreed with the accusation audit and began explaining why he thought Joaquin was careless with spending. Bruno also noted that he didn't have someone to bail him out like Joaquin did. Joaquin got a startup loan from his mother. Joaquin used mirrors to keep Bruno talking, and he did. Finally, Joaquin said, I know how the pressure from your wife can feel, I'm going through a divorce myself, and it really takes a lot out of you. Bruno then went on a 10-minute rant about his wife and let slip a huge piece of information. The wife was very upset because the bank that lent them the 20,000 euros had reviewed their loan and had given them two options, repay the loan in full or pay a much higher interest rate. Bingo! Joaquin and Jesus huddled after learning that and decided that Joaquin could reasonably pay just above the loan price because Bruno had already taken 14,000 euros in salary from the business. The letter from the bank put Bruno in a bad spot, and Joaquin figured he could bid low because there wasn't really a market for Bruno to sell his shares. They decided that 23,000 euros would be the magic number, with 11,000 euros up front, with the remaining 12,000 euros over a year period. Then things went sideways. Instead of waiting for Bruno to name a price, Joaquin jumped the gun and made his full offer, telling Bruno that he thought it was very fair. If there's one way to put off your counterpart, it's by implying that disagreeing with you is unfair. What happened next proved that. Bruno angrily hung up the phone and two days later Joaquin received an email from a guy saying he'd been hired to represent Bruno. They wanted 30,812 euros, 20,000 euros for the loan, 4,000 euros for salary, 6,230 euros for equity, and 582 euros for interest non-round figures that seemed unchangeable in their specificity. This guy was a pro. Jesus told Joaquin that he truly screwed up, but they both knew that Bruno was pretty desperate to sell. So they decided to use the multi-step no strategy to get Bruno to bid against himself. The worst case scenario, they decided, was that Bruno would just change his mind about selling his shares, and the status quo would continue. It was a risk they'd have to take. They crafted their first no message, the price you offered is very fair, and I certainly wish that I could afford it. Bruno has worked very hard for this business, and he deserves to be compensated appropriately. I am very sorry, but wish you the best of luck. Notice how they made no counteroffer and said no without using the word? Joaquin was shocked when the following day he received an email from the advisor, lowering the price to 28,346 euros. Joaquin and Jesus then crafted their second gentle no. Thank you for your offer. You were generous to reduce the price, which I greatly appreciate. I really wish that I could pay you this amount, but I am sincere in that I cannot afford this amount at this time. As you know, I am in the middle of a divorce, and I just cannot come up with that type of money. Again, I wish you the best of luck. The next day Joaquin received a one-line email from the advisor, dropping the price to 25,000 euros. Joaquin wanted to take it, but Jesus told him that he had some no steps to go. Joaquin fought him, but in the end he relented. There's a critical lesson there. The art of closing a deal is staying focused to the very end. There are crucial points at the finale when you must draw on your mental discipline. Don't think about what time the last flight leaves, or what it would be like to get home early and play golf. Do not let your mind wander. Remain focused, they wrote. Thank you again for the generous offer. You have really come down on the price, and I have tried very hard to come up with that amount. Unfortunately, no one is willing to lend me the money, not even my mother. I have tried various avenues but cannot come up with the funding. In the end, I can offer you 23,567 euros, although I can only pay 15,321 euros and 37 cents up front. I could pay you the remainder over a one-year period, but that is really the most I can do. I wish you the best in your decision. Brilliant use of specific numbers, and what an empathy-building way to say no without using the word. And it worked. Within one hour, the advisor responded to accept. Look at this closely. See how the mixture of mirroring and open-ended questions dragged out the information about Bruno's financial problems, and then the no method exploited his desperation? It might not have been a great idea to use this method if there had been another buyer, but with no one else it was a brilliant way to get Bruno to bid against himself. He lessons superstar negotiators real rainmakers know that a negotiation is a playing field beneath the words, where really getting to a good deal involves detecting and manipulating subtle non-obvious signals beneath the surface.
It is only by visualizing and modifying these subsurface issues that you can craft a great deal and make sure that it is implemented. As you put the following tools to use, remember this chapter's most important concept, that is, yes is nothing without how. Asking how knowing how and defining how are all part of the effective negotiator's arsenal. He would be unarmed without them. Ask calibrated how questions and ask them again and again. Asking how keeps your counterparts engaged but off balance. Answering the questions will give them the illusion of control. It will also lead them to contemplate your problems when making their demands. Use how questions to shape the negotiating environment. You do this by using how can I do that? As a gentle version of no. This will subtly push your counterpart to search for other solutions your solutions. And very often it will get them to bid against themselves. Don't just pay attention to the people you're negotiating with directly, always identify the motivations of the players behind the table. You can do so by asking how a deal will affect everybody else and how on board they are. Follow the 738-55% rule by paying close attention to tone of voice and body language. Incongruence between the words and nonverbal signs will show when your counterpart is lying or uncomfortable with a deal. Is the yes real or counterfeit? Test it with the rule of three. Use calibrated questions, summaries, and labels to get your counterpart to reaffirm their agreement at least three times. It's really hard to repeatedly lie or fake conviction. A person's use of pronouns offers deep insights into his or her relative authority. If you're hearing a lot of I, me, and my, the real power to decide probably lies elsewhere. Picking up a lot of we, they, and them, it's more likely you're dealing directly with a savvy decision maker, keeping his options open. Use your own name to make yourself a real person to the other side and even get your own personal discount. Humor and humanity are the best ways to break the ice and remove roadblocks. Chapter 9 Bargain Heart A few years ago I fell in love with a red Toyota 4Runner. Actually not just red but salsa red pearl. Kind of a smoldering red that seemed to glow at night. How sexy is that? I just had to have it, getting one became my obsession. I searched the dealers in metropolitan Washington, D.C. And I quickly realized that I wasn't the only one obsessed with getting that truck. There weren't any in that color in the entire area, none at all, save at one dealer. You know how they tell you not to shop for groceries when you're hungry? Well, I was hungry. Very hungry. Actually, I was in love. Dot 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 I sat down, centered myself, and strategized. This lot was my only shot. I had to make a count I drove to the dealer on a sunny Friday afternoon. I sat down across from the salesman, a nice enough guy named Stan, and told him how gorgeous the vehicle was. He offered me the usual smile he had me, he thought and mentioned the sticker price on that beautiful vehicle. $36,000. I gave him an understanding nod and pursed my lips. The key to beginning a haggle is to rattle the other guy ever so gently. You do it in the nicest way possible. If I could thread that needle, I had a good chance at getting my price. I can pay $30,000, I said, and I can pay it up front, all cash. I'll write a check today for the full amount. I'm sorry, I'm afraid I just can't pay any more. His smile flickered a little bit at the edges, as if it were losing focus. But he tightened it down and shook his head. I'm sure you can understand we can't do that. The sticker price is $36,000, after all. How am I supposed to do that? I asked deferentially. I'm sure he said, then paused as if he wasn't sure what he'd meant to say. I'm sure we can figure something out with financing the $36,000. It's a beautiful truck. Really amazing. I can't tell you how much I'd love to have it. It's worth more than what I'm offering. I'm sorry, this is really embarrassing. I just can't do that price. He stared at me in silence, a little befuddled now. Then he stood and went into the back for what seemed like an eternity. He was gone so long that I remember saying to myself, damn, I should have come and lower. They're going to come all the way down. Any response that's not an outright rejection of your offer means you have the edge. He returned and told me like it was Christmas that his boss had okayed a new price, $34,000. Wow, your offer is very generous, and this is the car of my dreams, I said. I really wish I could do that. I really do. This is so embarrassing. I simply can't. He dropped into silence and I didn't take the bait. I let the silence linger. And then with a sigh he trudged off again. He returned after another eternity. You win, he said. My manager okayed $32,500. He pushed a paper across the desk that even said you win in big letters. The words were even surrounded with smiley faces. 
I am so grateful. You've been very generous and I can't thank you enough. The truck is no doubt worth more than my price, I said. I'm sorry, I just can't do that. Puppy stood again. No smile now. Still befuddled. After a few seconds, he walked back to his manager and I leaned back. I could taste victory. A minute later no eternity this time he returned and sat. We can do that, he said. Two days later, I drove off in my salsa red pearl Toyota 4Runner for $30,000. God I love that truck. Still drive it today. Most negotiations hit that inevitable point where the slightly loosened and formal interplay between two people turns to confrontation and the proverbial brass tacks. You know the moment. You've mirrored and labeled your way to a degree of rapport, an accusation audit has cleared any lingering mental or emotional obstacles, and you've identified and summarized the interests and positions at stake, eliciting a that's right, and dot 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 now it's time to bargain. Here it is. The clash for cash, an uneasy dance of offers and counters that send most people into a cold sweat. If you count yourself among that majority, regarding the inevitable moment as nothing more than a necessary evil, there's a good chance you regularly get your clock clean by those who have learned to embrace it. No part of a negotiation induces more anxiety and unfocused aggression than bargaining, which is why it's the part that is more often fumbled and mishandled than any other. It's simply not a comfortable dynamic for most people. Even when we have the best laid plans, a lot of us wimp out when we get to the moment of exchanging prices. In this chapter, I'm going to explain the tactics that make up the bargaining process and look at how psychological dynamics determine which tactics should be used and how they should be implemented. Now, bargaining is not rocket science, but it's not simple intuition or mathematics, either. To bargain well, you need to shed your assumptions about the haggling process and learn to recognize the subtle psychological strategies that play vital roles at the bargaining table. Skilled bargainers see more than just opening offers, counter-offers, and closing moves. They see the psychological currents that run below the surface. Once you've learned to identify these currents, you'll be able to read bargaining situations more accurately and confidently answer the tactical questions that dog even the best negotiators. You'll be ready for the bare-knuckle bargaining. And they'll never see it coming. What type are you? A few years ago I was on my boat with one of my employees, a great guy named Keenan, I was supposed to be giving him a pep talk and performance review. When I think of what we do, I describe it as uncovering the riptide I said. Uncovering the riptide Keenan said. Yes, the idea is that we you and I and everyone here have the skills to identify the psychological forces that are pulling us away from shore and use them to get somewhere more productive. Somewhere more productive Keenan said. Exactly I said to a place where we can dot dot dot. We had talked for about 45 minutes when my son Brandon, who runs operations for the Black Swan Group, broke out laughing. I can't take it anymore. Don't you see? Really, Dad, don't you see? I blinked. Did I see what? I asked him. All Keenan is doing is mirroring you. And he's been doing it for almost an hour. Oh, I said, my face going red as Keenan began to laugh. He was totally right. Keenan had been playing with me the entire time, using the psychological tool that works most effectively with assertive guys like me. The mirror. Your personal negotiation style and that of your counterpart is formed through childhood, schooling, family, culture, and a million other factors. By recognizing it you can identify your negotiating strengths and weaknesses, and those of your counterpart, and adjust your mindset and strategies accordingly. Negotiation style is a crucial variable in bargaining. If you don't know what instinct will tell you or the other side to do in various circumstances, you'll have massive trouble gaming out effective strategies and tactics. You and your counterpart have habits of mind and behavior, and once you identify them you can leverage them in a strategic manner. Just like Keenan did, there's an entire library unto itself of research into the archetypes and behavioral profiles of all the possible people you're bound to meet at the negotiating table. It's flat-out overwhelming, so much so that it loses its utility. Over the last few years, in an effort primarily led by my son Brandon, we've consolidated and simplified all that research, cross-referencing it with our experiences in the field and the case studies of our business school students, and found that people fall into three broad categories. Some people are accommodators, others like me are basically assertive, and the rest are data-loving analysts. Hollywood negotiation scenes suggest that an assertive style is required for effective bargaining, but each of the styles can be effective. And to truly be effective you need elements from all three. A study of American Lawyer Negotiators 1 found that 65% of attorneys from two major U.S. cities used a cooperative style, 
while only 24% were truly assertive. And when these lawyers were graded for effectiveness, more than 75% of the effective group came from the cooperative type, only 12% were assertive. So if you're not assertive, don't despair. Blunt assertion is actually counterproductive most of the time. And remember, your personal negotiating style is not a straitjacket. No one is exclusively one style. Most of us have the capacity to throttle up our non-dominant styles, should the situation call for it. But there is one basic truth about a successful bargaining style. To be good, you have to learn to be yourself at the bargaining table. To be great you have to add to your strengths, not replace them. Here's a quick guide to classifying the type of negotiator you're facing, and the tactics that will be most fitting for you. Analyst analysts are methodical and diligent. They are not in a big rush. Instead, they believe that as long as they are working toward the best result in a thorough and systematic way, time is of little consequence. Their self-image is linked to minimizing mistakes. Their motto, as much time as it takes to get it right. Classic analysts prefer to work on their own and rarely deviate from their goals. They rarely show emotion, and they often use what is very close to the FMDJ voice I talked about in Chapter 3, slow and measured with a downward inflection. However, analysts often speak in a way that is distant and cold instead of soothing. This puts people off without them knowing it, and actually limits them from putting their counterpart at ease and opening them up. Analysts pride themselves on not missing any details in their extensive preparation. They will research for two weeks to get data they might have gotten in 15 minutes at the negotiating table, just to keep from being surprised. Analysts hate surprises. They are reserved problem solvers and information aggregators and are hypersensitive to reciprocity. They will give you a piece, but if they don't get a piece in return within a certain period of time, they lose trust and will disengage. This can often seem to come out of nowhere, but remember, since they like working on things alone, the fact that they are talking to you at all is, from their perspective, a concession. They will often view concessions by their counterpart as a new piece of information to be taken back and evaluated. Don't expect immediate counterproposals from them. People like this are skeptical by nature. So asking too many questions to start is a bad idea, because they're not going to want to answer until they understand all the implications. With them, it's vital to be prepared. Use clear data to drive your reason, don't ad-lib, use data comparisons to disagree and focus on the facts, warn them of issues early, and avoid surprises. Silence to them is an opportunity to think. They're not mad at you, and they're not trying to give you a chance to talk more. If you feel they don't see things the way you do, give them a chance to think first. Apologies have little value to them since they see the negotiation and their relationship with you as a person, largely as separate things. They respond fairly well in the moment to labels. They are not quick to answer calibrated questions or closed-ended questions when the answer is yes. They may need a few days to respond. If you're an analyst you should be worried about cutting yourself off from an essential source of data, your counterpart. The single biggest thing you can do is to smile when you speak. People will be more forthcoming with information to you as a result. Smiling can also become a habit that makes it easy for you to mask any moments you've been caught off guard. Accommodator The most important thing to this type of negotiator is the time spent building the relationship. Accommodators think as long as there is a free-flowing continuous exchange of information time is being well spent. As long as they're communicating, they're happy. Their goal is to be on great terms with their counterpart. They love the win-win. Of the three types, they are most likely to build great rapport without actually accomplishing anything. Accommodators want to remain friends with their counterpart even if they can't reach an agreement. They are very easy to talk to, extremely friendly, and have pleasant voices. They will yield a concession to appease or acquiesce and hope the other side reciprocates. If your counterparts are sociable, peace-seeking, optimistic, distractible, and poor time managers, they're probably accommodators. If they're your counterpart, be sociable and friendly. Listen to them talk about their ideas and use calibrated questions focused specifically on implementation to nudge them along and find ways to translate their talk into action. Due to their tendency to be the first to activate the reciprocity cycle, they may have agreed to give you something they can't actually deliver. Their approach to preparation can be lacking as they are much more focused on the person behind the table. They want to get to know you. They have a tremendous passion for the spirit of negotiation and what it takes not only to manage emotions, but also to satisfy them. 
While it is very easy to disagree with an accommodator because they want nothing more than to hear what you have to say, uncovering their objections can be difficult. They will have identified potential problem areas beforehand and will leave those areas unaddressed out of fear of the conflict they may cause. If you have identified yourself as an accommodator, stick to your ability to be very likable, but do not sacrifice your objections. Not only do the other two types need to hear your point of view, if you are dealing with another accommodator they will welcome it. Also be conscious of excess chit-chit. The other two types have no use for it, and if you're sitting across the table from someone like yourself, you will be prone to interactions where nothing gets done. Assertive The assertive type believes time is money, every wasted minute is a wasted dollar. Their self-image is linked to how many things they can get accomplished in a period of time. For them, getting the solution perfect isn't as important as getting it done. Assertives are fiery people who love winning above all else, often at the expense of others. Their colleagues and counterparts never question where they stand because they are always direct and candid. They have an aggressive communication style, and they don't worry about future interactions. Their view of business relationships is based on respect, nothing more and nothing less. Most of all, the assertive wants to be heard. And not only do they want to be heard, but they don't actually have the ability to listen to you until they know that you've heard them. They focus on their own goals rather than people. And they tell rather than ask. When you're dealing with assertive types, it's best to focus on what they have to say, because once they are convinced you understand them, then and only then will they listen for your point of view. To an assertive, every silence is an opportunity to speak more. Mirrors are a wonderful tool with this type. So are calibrated questions, labels, and summaries. The most important thing to get from an assertive will be a that's right that may come in the form of a that's it exactly or you hit it on the head. When it comes to reciprocity, this type is of the give an inch take a mile mentality. They will have figured they deserve whatever you have given them, so they will be oblivious to expectations of owing something in return. They will actually simply be looking for the opportunity to receive more. If they have given some kind of concession, they are surely counting the seconds until they get something in return. If you are an assertive, be particularly conscious of your tone. You will not intend to be overly harsh, but you will often come off that way. Intentionally soften your tone and work to make it more pleasant. Use calibrated questions and labels with your counterpart, since that will also make you more approachable and increase the chances for collaboration. We've seen how each of these groups views the importance of time differently. Time equals preparation. Time equals relationship. Time equals money. They also have completely different interpretations of silence. I'm definitely an assertive, and at a conference this accommodator type told me that he blew up a deal. I thought, what did you do, scream at the other guy and leave? Because that's me blowing up a deal. But it turned out that he went silent. For an accommodator type, silence is anger. For analysts, though, silence means they want to think. And assertive types interpret your silence as either you don't have anything to say or you want them to talk. I'm one, so I know. The only time I'm silent is when I've run out of things to say. The funny thing is when these cross over. When an analyst pauses to think, their accommodator counterpart gets nervous and an assertive one starts talking, thereby annoying the analyst, who thinks to herself, every time I try to think you take that as an opportunity to talk some more. Won't you ever shut up? Before we move on I want to talk about why people often fail to identify their counterpart's style. The greatest obstacle to accurately identifying someone else's style is what I call the I am normal paradox, that is, our hypothesis that the world should look to others as it looks to us. After all, who wouldn't make that assumption? But while innocent and understandable, thinking you're normal is one of the most damaging assumptions in negotiations. With it, we unconsciously project our own style on the other side. But with three types of negotiators in the world, there's a 66% chance your counterpart has a different style than yours, a different normal. A CEO once told me he expected 9 of 10 negotiations to fail. This CEO was likely projecting his beliefs onto the other side. In reality, he probably only matched with someone like-minded one of ten times. If he understood that his counterpart was different from him, he would most surely have increased his success rate. From the way they prepare to the way they engage in dialogue, the three types negotiate differently. So before you can even think about bargaining effectively, you have to understand your counterpart's normal. You have to identify their type by opening yourself to their difference. Because when it comes to negotiating, the golden rule is wrong. The black swan rule is don't treat others the way you want to be treated, treat them the way they need to be treated. 
I've got a complimentary PDF available that will help you identify your type and that of those around you. Please visit http colon slash slash info dot blackswamp dot com three types. Taking a punch negotiation academics like to treat bargaining as a rational process devoid of emotion. They talk about the zopa or zone of possible agreement which is where the sellers and buyers zones cross. Say Tony wants to sell his car and won't take less than $5,000 and Samantha wants to buy but won't pay more than $6,000. The zopa runs from $5,000 to $6,000. Some deals have zopas and some don't. It's all very rational. Or so they'd have you think. You need to disabuse yourself of that notion. In a real bargaining session, kick-ass negotiators don't use zopa. Experienced negotiators often led with a ridiculous offer, an extreme anchor. And if you're not prepared to handle it, you lose your moorings and immediately go to your maximum. It's human nature. Like the great ear abiding pugilist Mike Tyson once said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. As a well-prepared negotiator who seeks information and gathers it real endlessly, you're actually going to want the other guy to name a price first because you want to see his hand. You're going to welcome the extreme anchor. But extreme anchoring is powerful and you're human. Your emotions may well up. If they do there are ways to weather the storm without bidding against yourself or responding with anger. Once you learn these tactics, you'll be prepared to withstand the hidden counter with panache. First, deflect the punch in a way that opens up your counterpart. Successful negotiators often say no in one of the many ways we've talked about, how am I supposed to accept that? Or deflect the anchor with questions like what are we trying to accomplish here? Responses like these are great ways to refocus your counterpart when you feel you're being pulled into the compromised trap. You can also respond to a punch in the face anchor by simply pivoting to terms. What I mean by this is that when you feel you're being dragged into a haggle, you can detour the conversation to the non-monetary issues that make any final price work. You can do this directly by saying, in an encouraging tone of voice, let's put price off to the side for a moment and talk about what would make this a good deal. Or you could go at it more obliquely by asking, what else would you be able to offer to make that a good price for me? And if the other side pushes you to go first, wriggle from his grip. Instead of naming a price, allude to an incredibly high number that someone else might charge. Once when a hospital chain wanted me to name a price first, I said, well, if you go to Harvard Business School, they're going to charge you $2,500 a day per student. No matter what happens, the point here is to sponge up information from your counterpart. Letting your counterpart anchor first will give you a tremendous feel for him. All you need to learn is how to take the first punch. One of my Georgetown MBA students, a guy named Farrick, showed how not to fold after being punched when he went to hit up the MBA dean for funds to hold a big alumni event in Dubai. It was a desperate situation because he needed $600 and she was his last stop. At the meeting, Farrick told the dean about how excited the students were about the trip and how beneficial it would be for the Georgetown MBA brand in the region. Before he could even finish, the dean jumped in. Sounds like a great trip you guys are planning, she said. But money is tight, and I could authorize no more than $300. Farrick hadn't expected the dean to go so quickly. But things don't always go according to plan. That is a very generous offer given your budget limits, but I am not sure how that would help us achieve a great reception for the alums in the region, Farrick said, acknowledging her limits, but saying no without using the word. Then he dropped an extreme anchor. I have a very high amount in my head. $1,000 is what we need. As expected, the extreme anchor quickly knocked the dean off her limit. That is severely out of my range, and I am sure I can't authorize that. However, I will give you $500. Farrick was half tempted to full being $100 short wasn't make or break, but he remembered the curse of aiming low. He decided to push forward. The $500 got him closer to the goal, but not quite there, he said, $850 would work. The dean replied by saying that she was already giving more than what she wanted, and $500 was reasonable. At this point, if Farrick had been less prepared he would have given up, but he was ready for the punches. I think your offer is very reasonable, and I understand your restrictions, but I need more money to put on a great show for the school he said. How about $775? The dean smiled, and Farrick knew he had her. You seem to have a specific number in your head that you are trying to get to, she said. Just Ella to me. At that point Farrick was happy to give her his number as he felt she was sincere. 
I need $737.50 to make this work, and you are my last stop, he said. She laughed. The dean then praised him for knowing what he wanted and said she'd check her budget. Two days later, Farrick got an email saying her office would put in $750. Punching back, using assertion without getting used by it when a negotiation is far from resolution and going nowhere fast, you need to shake things up and get your counterpart out of their rigid mindset. In times like this, strong moves can be enormously effective tools. Sometimes a situation simply calls for you to be the aggressor and punch the other side in the face. That said, if you are basically a nice person, it will be a real stretch to hit the other guy like Mike Tyson. You can't be what you're not. As the Danish folk saying goes, you bake with the flour you have. But anyone can learn a few tools. Here are effective ways to assert smartly. Real anger, threats without anger, and strategic umbrage Marwin Sinister of INSEAD and Stanford University's Larissa Tiedens found that expressions of anger increase a negotiator's advantage in final take. Two anger shows passion and conviction that can help sway the other side to accept less. However, by heightening your counterpart's sensitivity to danger and fear, your anger reduces the resources they have for other cognitive activity. Setting them up to make bad concessions that will likely lead to implementation problems, thus reducing your gains. Also beware. Researchers have also found that disingenuous expressions of unfelt anger you know, faking it backfire, leading to intractable demands and destroying trust. For anger to be effective, it has to be real, the key for it is to be under control, because anger also reduces our cognitive ability. And so when someone puts out a ridiculous offer, one that really pisses you off, take a deep breath, allow a little anger, and channel it at the proposal, not the person and say, I don't see how that would ever work. Such well-timed defense taking known as strategic umbrage can wake your counterpart to the problem. In studies by Columbia University academics Daniel Ames and Abby Wozlak, people on the receiving end of strategic umbrage were more likely to rate themselves as over-assertive, even when the counterpart didn't think so. 3. The real lesson here is being aware of how this might be used on you. Please don't allow yourself to fall victim to strategic umbrage. Threats delivered without anger but with poise that is, confidence and self-control are great tools. Saying, I'm sorry that just doesn't work for me with poise, works. Why questions back in Chapter 7, I talked about the problems with why, across our planet and around the universe, why, makes people defensive. As an experiment, the next time your boss wants something done ask him or her why, and watch what happens. Then try it with a peer, a subordinate, and a friend. Observe their reactions and tell me if you don't find some level of defensiveness across the spectrum. Don't do this too much, though, or you'll lose your job and all your friends. The only time I say, why did you do that? Then a negotiation is when I want to knock someone back. It's an iffy technique, though, and I wouldn't advocate it. There is, however, another way to use why? Effectively. The idea is to employ the defensiveness the question triggers to get your counterpart to defend your position. I know it sounds weird, but it works. The basic format goes like this. When you want to flip a dubious counterpart to your side, ask them, why would you do that? But in a way that the that favors you. Let me explain. If you are working to lure a client away from a competitor, you might say, why would you ever do business with me? Why would you ever change from your existing supplier? They're great. In these questions, the why? Coaxes your counterpart into working for you. I messages using the first person singular pronoun is another great way to set a boundary without escalating into confrontation. When you say, I'm sorry, that doesn't work for me, the word I strategically focuses your counterpart's attention onto you long enough for you to make a point. The traditional I message is to you side to hit the pause button and step out of a bad dynamic. When you want to counteract unproductive statements from your counterpart, you can say, I feel when you because and that demands a timeout from the other person. But be careful with the big I. You have to be mindful not to use a tone that is aggressive or creates an argument. It's got to be cool and level. No neediness. Having the ready to walk mince it we've said previously that no deal is better than a bad deal. If you feel you can't say no then you've taken yourself hostage. Once you're clear on what your bottom line is, you have to be willing to walk away. Never be needy for a deal. Before we move on, I want to emphasize how important it is to maintain a collaborative relationship even when you're setting boundaries. Your response must always be expressed in the form of strong, yet empathic limit-setting boundaries that is, tough love not as hatred or violence. Anger and other strong emotions can on rare occasions be effective. 
but only as calculated acts, never a personal attack. In any bare-knuckle bargaining session, the most vital principle to keep in mind is never to look at your counterpart as an enemy. The person across the table is never the problem. The unsolved issue is. So focus on the issue. This is one of the most basic tactics for avoiding emotional escalations. Our culture demonizes people in movies and politics, which creates the mentality that if we only got rid of the person then everything would be okay. But this dynamic is toxic to any negotiation. Punching back is a last resort. Before you go there, I always suggest an attempt at de-escalating the situation. Suggest a timeout. When your counterparts step back and take a breath, they'll no longer feel that they are hostage to a bad situation. They'll regain a sense of agency and power and they'll appreciate you for that. Think of punching back and boundary setting tactics as a flattened S-curve. You've accelerated up the slope of a negotiation and hit a plateau that requires you to temporarily stop any progress, escalate or de-escalate the issue acting as the obstacle, and eventually bring the relationship back to a state of rapport and get back on the slope. Taking a positive constructive approach to conflict involves understanding that the bond is fundamental to any resolution. Never create an enemy. Ackerman Bargaining I've spent a lot of time talking about the psychological judo that I've made my stock and trade, the calibrated questions, the mirrors, the tools for knocking my counterpart off his game and getting him to bid against himself. But negotiation still comes down to determining who gets which slice of the pie and from time to time you're going to be forced into some real bare-knuckle bargaining with a hard-ass haggler. I face bare-knuckle bargaining all the time in the hostage world. I haggled with a lot of guys who stuck to their game plan and were used to getting their way. Pay or we'll kill they'd say, and they meant it. You had to have your skills drum tight to negotiate them down. You need tools. Back at FBI negotiation training, I learned the haggling system that I use to this day. And I swear by it. I call the system the Ackerman model because it came from this guy Mike Ackerman, an ex-CIA type who founded a kidnap for ransom consulting company based out of Miami. On many kidnappings we'd constantly be paired with Ackerman guys never Mike himself who helped design the haggle. After I retired from the FBI, I finally met Mike on a trip to Miami. When I told him I also use the system for business negotiations, he laughed and said he'd run the system by Howard Rifa, a legendary Harvard negotiation guy, and Howard had said it would work in any situation. So I felt pretty justified by that. The Ackerman model is an offer-counter-offer -offer method, at least on the surface. But it is a very effective system for beating the usual lackluster bargaining dynamic, which is the predictable result of meeting in the middle. The systematized and easy-to-remember process has only four steps. 1. Set your target price, your goal. 2. Set your first offer at 65% of your target price. 3. Calculate three raises of decreasing increments to 85, 95, and 100%. 4. Use lots of empathy and different ways of saying no to get the other side to counter before you increase your offer. 5. When calculating the final amount, use precise non-round numbers like, say, $37,893 rather than $38,000. It gives the number credibility and weight. 6. On your final number, throw in a non-monetary item that they probably don't want to show you're at your limit. The genius of this system is that it incorporates the psychological tactics we've discussed reciprocity, extreme anchors, loss aversion, and so on without you needing to think about them. If you'll bear with me for a moment, I'll go over the steps so you see what I mean. First, the original offer of 65% of your target price will set an extreme anchor, a big slap in the face that might bring your counterpart right to their price limit. The shock of an extreme anchor will induce a fight-or-flight reaction in all but the most experienced negotiators, limiting their cognitive abilities and pushing them into rash action. Now look at the progressive offer increases to 85, 95, and 100% of the target price. You're going to drop these in sparingly. After the counterpart has made another offer on their end, and after you've thrown out a few calibrated questions to see if you can bait them into bidding against themselves, when you make these offers, they work on various levels. First, they play on the norm of reciprocity, they inspire your counterpart to make a concession, too. Just like people are more likely to send Christmas cards to people who first send cards to them, they are more likely to make bargaining concessions to those who have made compromises in their direction. Second, the diminishing size of the increases notice that they decrease by half each time convinces your counterpart that he's squeezing you to the point of breaking. 
by the time they get to the last one, they'll feel that they've really gotten every last drop. This really juices their self-esteem. Researchers have found that people getting concessions often feel better about the bargaining process than those who are given a single firm, fair offer. In fact, they feel better even when they end up paying more or receiving less than they otherwise might. Finally, the power of non-round numbers bears reiterating. Back in Haiti, I used to use the Ackerman system ferociously. Over 18 months we got two or three kidnappings a week, so from experience, we knew the market prices were $15,000 to $75,000 per victim. Because I was a hard ass, I made it my goal to get in under $5,000 in every kidnapping that I ran. One really stands out, the first one I mentioned in this book. I went through the Ackerman process, knocking them off their game with an extreme anchor, hitting them with calibrated questions, and slowly gave progressively smaller concessions. Finally, I dropped the weird number that closed the deal. I'll never forget the head of the Miami FBI office calling my colleague the next day and saying, Voss got this guy out for $4,751? How does $1 make a difference? They were howling with laughter, and they had a point. That $1 is ridiculous. But it works on our human nature. Notice that you can't buy anything for $2, but you can buy a million things for $1.99. How does a cent change anything? It doesn't. But it makes a difference every time. We just like $1.99 more than $2, even if we know it's a trick. Negotiating a rent cut after receiving notice of an increase eight months after a Georgetown MBA student of mine named Miss Harry signed a rental contract for $1,850 a month, he gets some unwelcome news. His landlord informed him that if he wanted to re-up, it would be $2,100 a month for 10 months or $2,000 a month a year. Miss Harry loved the place and didn't think he'd find a better one, but the price was already high and he couldn't afford more. Taking to heart our class slogan, you fall to your highest level of preparation, he dove into the real estate listings and found that prices for comparable apartments were $1,800-$1,950 a month, but none of them were in as good a building. He then examined his own finances and figured the rent he wanted to pay was $1,830. He requested a sit-down with his rental agent. This was going to be tough. At their meeting, Miss Harry laid out his situation. His experience in the building had been really positive, he said. And, he pointed out, he always paid on time. It would be sad for him to leave, he said, and sad for the landlord to lose a good tenant. The agent nodded. Totally in agreement, he said. That's why I think it will benefit both of us to agree on renewing the lease. Here Miss Harry pulled out his research. Buildings around the neighborhood were offering much lower prices, he said. Even though your building is better in terms of location and services, how am I supposed to pay $200 extra? The negotiation was on. The agent went silent for a few moments and then said, You make a good point, but this is still a good price. And as you noted, we can charge a premium. Miss Harry then dropped an extreme anchor. I fully understand, you do have a better location and amenities. But I'm sorry, I just can't, he said. Would $1,730 a month for a year lease sound fair to you? The agent laughed and when he finished said there was no way to accept that number because it was way below market price. Instead of getting pulled into a haggle, Miss Harry smartly pivoted to calibrated questions. Okay, so please help me understand. How do you price lease renewals? The agent didn't say anything shocking merely that they used factors like area prices and supply and demand but that gave Miss Harry the opening to argue that his leaving would open the landlord to the risk of having an unrented apartment and the cost of repainting. One month unrented would be a $2,000 loss, he said. Then he made another offer. Now, you're probably shaking your head that he's making two offers without receiving one in return. And you're right, normally that's verbatim. But you have to be able to improvise. If you feel in control of a negotiation, you can do two or three moves at a time. Don't let the rules ruin the flow. Let me try and move along with you. How about $1,790 for 12 months? The agent paused. Sir, I understand your concerns, and what you said makes sense, he said. Your number, though, is very low. However, give me time to think this out and we can meet at another time. How does that sound? Remember, any response that is not an outright rejection means you have the edge. Five days later the two met again. I ran the numbers, and believe me this is a good deal the agent started. I am able to offer you $1,950 a month for a year. Miss Harry knew he'd won. 
The agent just needed a little push. So he praised the agent and said no without saying no. And notice how he brilliantly mislabels in order to get the guy to open up. That is generous of you, but how am I supposed to accept it when I can move a few blocks away and stay for $1,800? $150 a month means a lot to me. You know I am a student. I don't know, it seems like you would rather run the risk of keeping the place unrented. It's not that the agent answered. But I can't give you a number lower than the market. Miss Harry made a dramatic pause, as if the agent was extracting every cent he had. Then I tell you what, I initially went up from $1,730 to $1,790, he said, sighing. I will bring it up to $1,810. And I think this works well for both. The agent shook his head. This is still lower than the market, sir. And I cannot do that. Miss Harry then prepared to give the last of his Ackerman offers. He went silent for a while and then asked the agent for a pen and paper. Then he started doing fake calculations to seem like he was really pushing himself. Finally, he looked up at the agent and said, I did some numbers, and the maximum I can afford is $1,829. The agent bobbed his head from side to side, as if getting his mind around the offer. At last, he spoke. Wow. $1,829, he said. You seem very precise. You must be an accountant. Miss Harry was not. Listen, I value you wanting to renew with us, and for that I think we can make this work for a 12-month lease. ka -ching. Notice this brilliant combination of decreasing Ackerman offers, non-round numbers, deep research, smart labeling, and saying no without saying no? That's what gets you a rent discount when a landlord wanted to raise his monthly take. Key lessons when push comes to shove and it will you're going to find yourself sitting across the table from a bare-knuckle negotiator. After you've finished all the psychologically nuanced stuff the labeling and mirroring and calibrating you are going to have to hash out the brass tacks. For most of us, that ain't fun. Top negotiators know, however, that conflict is often the path to great deals. And the best find ways to actually have fun engaging in it. Conflict brings out truth, creativity, and resolution. So the next time you find yourself face to face with a bare knuckle bargainer, remember the lessons in this chapter. Identify your counterpart's negotiating style. Once you know whether they are accommodator, assertive, or analyst, you'll know the correct way to approach them. Prepare, prepare, prepare. When the pressure is on, you don't rise to the occasion, you fall to your highest level of preparation. So design an ambitious but legitimate goal, and then game out the labels, calibrated questions, and responses you'll use to get there. That way, once you're at the bargaining table, you won't have to wing it. Get ready to take a punch. Kick-ass negotiators usually lead with an extreme anchor to knock you off your game. If you're not ready, you'll flee to your maximum without a fight. So prepare your dodging tactics to avoid getting sucked into the compromised trap set boundaries and learn to take a punch or punch back without anger. The guy across the table is not the problem, the situation is. Prepare an Ackerman plan. Before you head into the weeds of bargaining, you'll need a plan of extreme anchor, calibrated questions, and well-defined offers. Remember, 65, 85, 95, 100 percent. Decreasing raises and ending on non-round numbers will get your counterpart to believe that he's squeezing you for all you're worth when you're really getting to the number you want. Chapter 10 Find the Black Swan at 11.30 a.m. On June 17, 1981, a beautiful 70-degree spring day with an insistent westerly breeze, 37-year-old William Griffin left the Seconfleur bedroom where he lived in his parents' Rochester, New York, home and trod down the shoe buff stairs that led to their meticulous living room. At the bottom he stopped, paused, and then, without a word of warning, shot off three shotgun blasts that killed his mother and a handyman who was hanging wallpaper and critically wounded his stepfather. The sound reverberated in the enclosed space. Griffin then left the house and shot a workman and two bystanders as he jogged two blocks to the security trust company, a neighborhood bank. Seconds after he entered, people began sprinting from the bank as Griffin took nine bank employees hostage and ordered the customers to leave. For the next three and a half hours, Griffin led police and FBI agents in a violent standoff in which he shot and wounded the first two police officers who responded to the bank's silent alarm and shot six people who happened to be walking near the bank. Griffin shot off so many rounds more than 100 in all that the police used a garbage truck to shield one officer as he was being rescued. 
Waving the nine bank employees into a small office at 2.30 p.m., Griffin told the manager to call the police and deliver a message. Outside, FBI agent Clint Van Zandt stood by while Rochester police officer Jim O'Brien picked up the phone. Either you come to the front entrance doors of the bank at 3 o'clock and have a shootout with him in the parking lot, the manager blurted through her tears, or he's going to start killing hostages and throwing out bodies. Then the line went Ed. Now, never in the history of the United States had a hostage taker killed a hostage on deadline. The deadline was always a way to focus the mind, what the bad guys really wanted was money, respect, and a helicopter. Everyone knew that. It was a permanent and inalterable known known. It was the truth. But that permanent and inalterable truth was about to change. What came next showed the power of black swans, those hidden and unexpected pieces of information, those unknown unknowns whose unearthing has game changing effects on a negotiation dynamic. Negotiation breakthroughs when the game shifts inalterably in your favor are created by those who can identify and utilize black swans. Here's how finding leverage in the predictably unpredictable at exactly 3 p.m. Griffin gestured toward one of his hostages, a 29-year-old teller named Margaret Moore, and told her to walk to the glass bank doors. Petrified, Moore did as she was ordered, but first cried out that she was a single parent with a young son. Griffin didn't seem to hear her, or to care. Once the weeping Moore made it to the vestibule, Griffin shot off two blasts from his 12-gauge shotgun. Both of the heavy rounds struck Moore in the midsection, violently blowing her through the glass door and almost cutting her body in half. Outside, law enforcement was stunned into silence. It was obvious that Griffin didn't want money or respect or an escape route. The only way he was coming out was in a body bag. At that moment, Griffin walked over to a full-length bank window and pressed his body against the glass. He was in full view of a sniper stationed in the church across the street. Griffin knew quite well the sniper was there, earlier in the day he'd shot at him. Less than a second after Griffin's silhouette appeared in his scope, the sniper pulled the trigger. Griffin crumpled to the floor, dead. Black Swan Theory tells us that things happen that were previously thought to be impossible or never thought of at all. This is not the same as saying that sometimes things happen against one in a million odds, but rather that things never imagined do come to pass. The idea of the Black Swan was popularized by risk analyst Nassim Nicholas Taleb in his best-selling books Fooled by Randomness, 2001, 1, and The Black Swan, 2007, 2, but the term goes back much further. Until the 17th century, people could only imagine white swans because all swans ever seen had possessed white feathers. In 17th century London, it was common to refer to impossible things as black swans. But then the Dutch explorer Willem de Vlaming went to Western Australia in 1697 and saw a black swan. Suddenly the unthinkable and unthought was real. People had always predicted that the next swan they saw would be white, but the discovery of black swans shattered this worldview. Black swans are just a metaphor, of course. Think of Pearl Harbor, the rise of the Internet, 9-11s, and the recent banking crisis. None of the events above was predicted yet on reflection, the markers were all there. It's just that people weren't paying attention. As Taleb uses the term, the black swan symbolizes the uselessness of predictions based on previous experience. Black swans are events or pieces of knowledge that sit outside our regular expectations and therefore cannot be predicted. This is a crucial concept in negotiation. In every negotiating session, there are different kinds of information. There are those things we know, like our counterpart's name and their offer and our experiences from other negotiations. Those are known knowns. There are those things we are certain that exist, but we don't know, like the possibility that the other side might get sick and leave us with another counterpart. Those are known unknowns and they are like poker wild cards, you know they're out there, but you don't know who has them. But most important are those things we don't know that we don't know, pieces of information we've never imagined, but that would be game-changing if uncovered. Maybe our counterpart wants the deal to fail because he's leaving for a competitor. These unknown unknowns are black swans. With their known knowns and prior expectations so firmly guiding their approach, Van Zant and really the entire FBI were blind to the clues and connections that showed there was something outside of the predictable at play. They couldn't see the black swans in front of them. I don't mean to single out Van Zandt here. He did all of law enforcement a service by highlighting this event, and he told me and a room full of agents the story of that horrible June day during a training session at Quantico. 
It was an introduction to the suicide by cop phenomenon when an individual deliberately creates a crisis situation to provoke a lethal response from law enforcement but there was an even greater lesson at stake. The point of the story then and now was how important it is to recognize the unexpected to make sure things like Moore's death never happen again. On that day in June 1981, Orion kept calling the bank, but each time the bank employee who answered quickly hung up. It was at that moment they should have realized the situation was outside the known. Hostage takers always talk because they always had demands, they always wanted to be heard, respected, and paid. But this guy didn't. Then, midway through the standoff, a police officer entered the command post with the news that a double homicide with a third person critically wounded had been reported a few blocks away. Do we need to know this? Van Zandt said. Is there a connection? No one knew or found out in time. If they had, they might have uncovered a second black swan, that Griffin had already killed several people without making monetary demands. And then, a few hours in, the hostage taker had one of the hostages read a note to the police over the phone. Curiously, there were no demands. Instead, it was a rambling diatribe about Griffin's life and the wrongs he'd endured. The note was so long and unfocused it was never read in its entirety. Because of this, one important line another black swan wasn't registered. Dot 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 after the police take my life dot dot dot. Because these black swans weren't uncovered, Van Zant and his colleagues never saw the situation for what it was. Griffin wanted to die, and he wanted the police to do it for him. Nothing like this a shootout on a deadline? Had ever happened to the FBI, so they tried to fit the information into what had happened in the past, into the old templates. They wondered, what does he actually want? After scaring them for a bit, they expected Griffin to pick up the phone and start a dialogue. No one gets killed on deadline. Or so they thought. Uncovering unknown nun owns the lesson of what happened at 3 p.m. on June 17, 1981, in Rochester, New York, was that when bits and pieces of a case don't add up, it's usually because our frames of reference are off, they will never add up unless we break free of our expectations. Every case is new. We must let what we know our known knowns guide us, but not blind us to what we do not know. We must remain flexible and adaptable to any situation. We must always retain a beginner's mind. And we must never overvalue our experience or undervalue the informational and emotional realities served up moment by moment, in whatever situation we face. But those were not the only important lessons of that tragic event. If an over-reliance on known knowns can shackle a negotiator to assumptions that prevent him from seeing and hearing all that a situation presents, then perhaps an enhanced receptivity to the unknown unknowns can free that same negotiator to see and hear the things that can produce dramatic breakthroughs. From the moment I heard the tale of June 17, 1981, I realized that I had to completely change how I approached negotiating. I began to hypothesize that in every negotiation each side is in possession of at least three black swans, three pieces of information that, were they to be discovered by the other side, would change everything. My experience since has proven this to be true. Now, I should note here that this is not just a small tweak to negotiation technique. It is not coincidence that I embrace Black Swan as the name of my company and the symbol of our approach. Finding and acting on Black Swan's mandates a shift in your mindset. It takes negotiation from being a one-dimensional move-counter-move game of checkers to a three-dimensional game that's more emotional, adaptive, intuitive dot 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 and truly effective. Finding Black Swans is no easy task, of course. We are all to some degree blind. We do not know what is around the corner until we turn it. By definition we do not know what we don't know. That's why I say that finding and understanding black swans requires a change of mindset. You have to open up your established pathways and embrace more intuitive and nuanced ways of listening. This is vital to people of all walks of life, from negotiators to inventors and marketers. What you don't know can kill you, or your deal. But to find it out is incredibly difficult. The most basic challenge is that people don't know the questions to ask the customer, the user dot 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 the counterpart. Unless correctly interrogated, most people aren't able to articulate the information you want. The world didn't tell Steve Jobs that it wanted an iPad. He uncovered our need, that black swan, without us knowing the information was there. The problem is that conventional questioning and research techniques are designed to confirm known knowns and reduce uncertainty. They don't dig into the unknown. Negotiations will always suffer from limited predictability. Your counterpart might tell you, it's a lovely plot of land without mentioning that it is also a super fun site. They'll say, are the neighbors noisy? Well, everyone makes a bit of noise, don't they? 
When the actual fact is that a heavy metal band practices there nightly, it is the person best able to unearth, adapt to, and exploit the unknowns that will come out on top. To uncover these unknowns, we must interrogate our world, must put out a call, and intensely listen to the response. Ask lots of questions. Read nonverbal clues and always voice your observations with your counterpart. This is nothing beyond what you've been learning up to now. It is merely more intense and intuitive. You have to feel for the truth behind the camouflage, you have to note the small pauses that suggest discomfort and lies. Don't look to verify what you expect. If you do, that's what you'll find. Instead, you must open yourself up to the factual reality that is in front of you. This is why my company changed its format for preparing and engaging in a negotiation. No matter how much research our team has done prior to the interaction, we always ask ourselves, why are they communicating what they are communicating right now? Remember, negotiation is more like walking on a tightrope than competing against an opponent. Focusing so much on the end objective will only distract you from the next step, and that can cause you to fall off the rope. Concentrate on the next step because the rope will lead you to the end, as long as all the steps are completed. Most people expect that black swans are highly proprietary or closely guarded information, when in fact the information may seem completely innocuous. Either sign may be completely oblivious to its importance. Your counterpart always has pieces of information whose value they do not understand. The three types of leverage I'm going to come back to specific techniques for uncovering black swans, but first I'd like to examine what makes them so useful. The answer is leverage. Black swans are leverage multipliers. They give you the upper hand. Now, leverage is the magic word, but it's also one of those concepts that negotiation experts casually throw about, but rarely delve into, so I'd like to do so here. In theory, leverage is the ability to inflict loss and withhold gain. Where does your counterpart want to gain and what do they fear losing? Discover these pieces of information, we are told, and you'll build leverage over the other side's perceptions, actions, and decisions. In practice, where our irrational perceptions are our reality, loss and gain are slippery notions, and it often doesn't matter what leverage actually exists against you, what really matters is the leverage they think you have on them. That's why I say there's always leverage. As an essentially emotional concept, it can be manufactured whether it exists or not. If they're talking to you, you have leverage. Who has leverage in a kidnapping? The kidnapper or the victim's family? Most people think the kidnapper has all the leverage. Sure, the kidnapper has something you love, but you have something they lust for. Which is more powerful? Moreover, how many buyers do the kidnappers have for the commodity they are trying to sell? What business is successful if there's only one buyer? Leverage has a lot of inputs, like time and necessity and competition. If you need to sell your house now, you have less leverage than if you don't have a deadline. If you want to sell it but don't have to, you have more. And if various people are bidding on it at once, good on you. I should note that leverage isn't the same thing as power. Donald Trump has tons of power, but if he's stranded in a desert and the owner of the only store for miles has the water he wants, the vendor has the leverage. One way to understand leverage is as a fluid that slushes between the parties. As a negotiator you should always be aware of which side, at any given moment, feels they have the most to lose if negotiations collapse. The party who feels they have more to lose and are the most afraid of that loss has less leverage, and vice versa. To get leverage, you have to persuade your counterpart that they have something real to lose if the deal falls through. At a taxonomic level, there are three kinds, positive, negative, and normative. Positive leverage Positive leverage is quite simply your ability as a negotiator to provide or withhold things that your counterpart wants. Whenever the other side says, I want dot 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 as in, I want to buy your car you have positive leverage. When they say that, you have power. You can make their desire come true, you can withhold it and thereby inflict pain, or you can use their desire to get a better deal with another party. Here's an example. Three months after you've put your business on the market, a potential buyer finally tells you, yes, I'd like to buy it. You're thrilled, but a few days later your joy turns to disappointment when he delivers an offer so low it's insulting. This is the only offer you have, so what do you do? Now, hopefully you've had contact with other buyers, even casually. If you have, you can use the offer to create a sense of competition and thereby kick off a bidding war. At least you'll force them to make a choice. But even if you don't have other offers or the interested buyer is your first choice, you have more power than before your counterpart revealed his desire. 
you control what they want. That's why experienced negotiators delay making offers they don't want to give up leverage. Positive leverage should improve your psychology during negotiation. You've gone from a situation where you want something from the investor to a situation where you both want something from each other. Once you have it, you can then identify other things your opponent wants. Maybe he wants to buy your firm over time. Help him do that if you'll increase the price. Maybe his offer is all the money he has. Help him get what he wants your business by saying you can only sell him 75% for his offer. Negative leverage Negative leverage is what most civilians picture when they hear the word leverage. It's a negotiator's ability to make his counterpart suffer. And it is based on threats. You have negative leverage if you can tell your counterpart, if you don't fulfill your commitment, pay your bill, etc., I will destroy your reputation. This sort of leverage gets people's attention because of a concept we've discussed, loss aversion. As effective negotiators have long known and psychologists have repeatedly proved, potential losses loom larger in the human mind than do similar gains. Getting a good deal may push us toward making a risky bet, but saving our reputation from destruction is a much stronger motivation. So what kind of black swans do you look to be aware of as negative leverage? Effective negotiators look for pieces of information, often obliquely revealed, that show what is important to their counterpart. Who is their audience? What signifies status and reputation to them? What most worries them? To find this information, one method is to go outside the negotiating table and speak to a third party that knows your counterpart. The most effective method is to gather it from interactions with your counterpart. That said, a word of warning. I do not believe in making direct threats and I'm extremely careful with even subtle ones. Threats can be like nuclear bombs. There will be a toxic residue that will be difficult to clean up. You have to handle the potential of negative consequences with care, or you will hurt yourself and poison or blow up the whole process. If you shove your negative leverage down your counterpart's throat, it might be perceived as you taking away their autonomy. People will often sooner die than give up their autonomy. They'll at least act irrationally and shut off the negotiation. A more subtle technique is to label your negative leverage and thereby make it clear without attacking. Sentences like it seems like you strongly value the fact that you've always paid on time or it seems like you don't care what position you are leaving me in can really open up the negotiation process. Normative leverage Every person has a set of rules and a moral framework. Normative leverage is using the other party's norms and standards to advance your position. If you can show inconsistencies between their beliefs and their actions, you have normative leverage. No one likes to look like a hypocrite. For example, if your counterpart lets slip that they generally pay a certain multiple of cash flow when they buy a company, you can frame your desired price in a way that reflects that valuation. Discovering the black swans that give you normative valuation can be as easy as asking what your counterpart believes and listening openly. You want to see what language they speak and speak it back to them. Know their religion in March 2003, I led the negotiation with a farmer who became one of the most unlikely post 9 11s terrorists you can imagine. The drama started when Dwight Watson, a North Carolina tobacco grower, hooked up his Jeep to a John Deere tractor, festooned with banners and an inverted U.S. flag, and towed it to Washington, D.C., to protest government policies he thought were putting tobacco farmers out of business. When Watson got to the Capitol, he pulled his tractor into a pond between the Washington Monument and the Vietnam Veterans Memorial and threatened to blow it up with the organophosphate bombs he claimed were inside. The Capitol went into lockdown as the police blocked off an eight-block area from the Lincoln Memorial to the Washington Monument. Coming just months after the Beltway sniper attacks and alongside the build-up to the Iraq War, the ease with which Watson threw the nation's capital into turmoil freaked people out. Talking on his cell phone, Watson told the Washington Post that he was on a do-or-die mission to show how reduced subsidies were killing tobacco farmers. He told the Post that God had instructed him to stage his protest and he wasn't going to leave. If this is the way America will be run, the hell with it, he said. I will not surrender. They can blow me out of the water. I'm ready to go to heaven. The FBI deployed me to a converted RV on the National Mall, where I was to guide a team of FBI agents and U.S. Park Police as we tried to talk Watson out of killing himself and who knows how many others. And then we got down to business. Like you'd expect of a negotiation with a guy threatening to destroy a good part of the U.S. Capitol, it was righteously tense. Sharpshooters had their weapons trained on Watson, and they had the green light to shoot if he made any crazy moves. In any negotiation, but especially in a tense one like this, it's not how well you speak, but how well you listen that determines your success. 
Understanding the other is a precondition to be able to speak persuasively and develop options that resonate for them. There is the visible negotiation and then all the things that are hidden under the surface, the secret negotiation space wherein the black swans dwell. Access to this hidden space very often comes through understanding the other side's worldview, their reason for being, their religion. Indeed, digging into your counterpart's religion, sometimes involving God but not always, inherently implies moving beyond the negotiating table and into the life, emotional and otherwise, of your counterpart. Once you've understood your counterpart's worldview, you can build influence. That's why as we talk with Watson, I spend my energy trying to unearth who he was, rather than logically arguing him into surrender. From this we learned that Watson had been finding it increasingly hard to make a living on his 1,200-acre tobacco farm, which had been in his family for five generations. After being hit by a drought and having his crop quota cut by half, Watson decided he couldn't afford the farm anymore and drove to Washington to make his point. He wanted attention, and knowing what he wanted gave us positive leverage. Watson also told us he was a veteran, and veterans had rules. This is the kind of music you want to hear, as it provides normative leverage. He told us that he would be willing to surrender, but not right away. As a military police officer in the 82nd Airborne in the 1970s, he learned that if he was trapped behind enemy lines, he could withdraw with honor if reinforcements didn't arrive within three days. But not before. Now, we had articulated rules we could hold him to, and the admission that he could withdraw also implied that, despite his bluster about dying, he wanted to live. One of the first things you try to decide in a hostage negotiation is whether your counterpart's vision of the future involves them living. And Watson had answered yes. We use this information a piece of negative leverage, as we could take away something he wanted, life and started working it alongside the positive leverage of his desire to be heard. We emphasized to Watson that he had already made national news, and if he wanted his message to survive he was going to have to live. Watson was smart enough to understand that there was a real chance he wouldn't make it out alive, but he still had his rules of military honor. His own desires and fears helped generate some positive and negative leverage, but they were secondary to the norms by which he lived his life. It was tempting to just wait until the third day, but I doubted we'd get that far. With each passing hour the atmosphere was growing tenser. The capital was under siege and we had reason to believe he might have explosives. If he made one wrong move, one spastic freakout, the snipers would kill him. He'd already had several angry outbursts, so every hour that passed endangered him. He could still get himself killed. But we couldn't hit on that at all, we couldn't threaten to kill him and expect that to work. The reason for that is something called the paradox of power namely, the harder we push the more likely we are to be met with resistance. That's why you have to use negative leverage sparingly. Still, time was short and we had to speed things up. But how? What happened next was one of those glorious examples of how deeply listening to understand your counterpart's worldview can reveal a black swan that transforms a negotiation dynamic. Watson didn't directly tell us what we needed to know, but by close attention we uncovered a subtle truth that informed everything he said. About 36 hours in, Winnie Miller, an FBI agent on our team who'd been listening intently to subtle references Watson had been making, turned to me. He's a devout Christian, she told me. Tell him tomorrow is the dawn of the third day. That's the day Christians believe Jesus Christ left his tomb and ascended to heaven. If Christ came out on the dawn of the third day, why not Watson? It was a brilliant use of deep listening. By combining that subtext of Watson's words with knowledge of his worldview, she let us show Watson that we not only were listening, but that we had also heard him. If we'd understood his subtext correctly, this would let him end the standoff honorably, and to do so with the feeling that he was surrendering to an adversary that respected him and his beliefs. By positioning your demands within the worldview your counterpart uses to make decisions, you show them respect, and that gets you attention and results. Knowing your counterpart's religion is more than just gaining normative leverage per se. Rather, it's gaining a holistic understanding of your counterpart's worldview in this case, literally a religion and using that knowledge to inform your negotiating moves. Using your counterpart's religion is extremely effective in large part because it has authority over them. The other guy's religion is what the market, the experts, God or society whatever matters to him has determined to be fair and just. And people defer to that authority. In the next conversation with Watson, we mentioned that the next morning was the dawn of the third day. There was a long moment of silence on the other end of the line. Our negotiation operation center was so quiet you could hear the heartbeat of the guy next to you. Watson coughed. I'll come out, he said. 
and he did, ending a 48-hour standoff, saving himself from harm and allowing the nation's capital to resume its normal life. No explosives were found. While the importance of knowing their religion should be clear from Watson's story, here are two tips for reading religion correctly. Review everything you hear. You will not hear everything the first time, so double-check. Compare notes with your team members. You will often discover new information that will help you advance the negotiation. Use backup listeners whose only job is to listen between the lines. They will hear things you miss. In other words, listen, listen again, and listen some more. We've seen how a holistic understanding of your counterpart's religion a huge black swan can provide normative leverage that leads to negotiating results. But there are other ways in which learning your counterpart's religion enables you to achieve better outcomes. The similarity principle research by social scientists has confirmed something effective negotiators have known for ages. Namely, we trust people more when we view them as being similar or familiar. People trust those who are in their in-group. Belonging is a primal instinct. And if you can trigger that instinct, that sense that, oh, we see the world the same way, then you immediately gain influence. When our counterpart displays attitudes, beliefs, ideas, even modes of dress that are similar to our own, we tend to like and trust them more. Similarities as shallow as club memberships or college alumni status increase rapport. That's why in many cultures negotiators spend large amounts of time building rapport before they even think of offers. Both sides know that the information they glean could be vital to effective deal-making and leverage building. It's a bit like dogs circling each other, smelling each other's behind. I once worked a deal for our services with the CEO in Ohio, where the similarity principle played a major role. My counterpart was constantly making references that I recognized as being sort of born-again Christian material. As we talked he kept going back and forth on whether he should bring in his advisors. The whole issue of his advisors clearly pained him, at one point he even said, nobody understands me. At that moment I began to rack my brain for the Christian word that captured the essence of what he was saying. And then the term came to my mind, a term people often used in church to describe the duty one had to administer our own and our world's and therefore God's resources with honesty, accountability, and responsibility. This is really stewardship for you, isn't it? I said. His voice immediately strengthened. Yes, you're the only one who understands, he said. And he hired us at that moment. By showing that I understood his deeper reasons for being and accessing a sense of similarity, of mutual belongingness, I was able to bring him to the deal. The minute I established a kind of shared identity with this Christian, we were in. Not simply because of similarity alone, but because of the understanding implied by that moment of similarity. The power of hopes and dreams once you know your counterpart's religion and can visualize what he truly wants out of life, you can employ those aspirations as a way to get him to follow you. Every engineer, every executive, every child all of us want to believe we are capable of the extraordinary. As children, our daydreams feature ourselves as primary players in great moments. An actor winning an Oscar, an athlete hitting the game-winning shot. As we grow older, however, our parents, teachers, and friends talk more of what we can't and shouldn't do than what is possible. We begin to lose faith. But when someone displays a passion for what we've always wanted and conveys a purposeful plan of how to get there, we allow our perceptions of what's possible to change. We're all hungry for a map to joy, and when someone is courageous enough to draw it for us, we naturally follow. So when you ascertain your counterpart's unattained goals, invoke your own power and follow ability by expressing passion for their goals and for their ability to achieve them. Tad Leonsis is great at this. As the owner of the Washington Wizards professional basketball team and the Washington Capitals professional hockey team, he is always talking about creating the immortal moments in sports that people will tell their grandchildren about. Who doesn't want to come to an agreement with someone who is going to make them immortal? Religion is a reason research studies have shown that people respond favorably to requests made in a reasonable tone of voice and followed with a because reason. In a famous study from the late 1970s, three Harvard psychology professor Ellen Langer and her colleagues approached people waiting for copy machines and asked if they could cut the line. Sometimes they gave a reason, sometimes they didn't. What she found was crazy. Without her giving a reason, 60% let her through, but when she did give one, more than 90% did. And it didn't matter if the reason made sense. Excuse me, I have five pages. May I cut a line because I have to make copies? work great. People just responded positively to the framework. 
while idiotic reasons work with something simple like photocopying, on more complicated issues, you can increase your effectiveness by offering reasons that reference your counterpart's religion. Had that Christian CEO offered me a lowball offer when he agreed to hire my firm, I might have answered, I'd love to, but I too have a duty to be a responsible steward of my resources. It's not crazy, it's a clue it's not human nature to embrace the unknown. It scares us. When we are confronted by it, we ignore it, we run away, or we label it in ways that allow us to dismiss it. In negotiations, that label most often takes the form of the statement, they're crazy. That's one reason I've been highly critical of some of the implementation of America's hostage negotiation policy which is that we don't negotiate with those we refer broadly to as the terrorists including groups from the Taliban to ISIS. The rationale for this non-engagement is summarized well by the journalist Peter Bergen, CNN's national security analyst. Negotiations with religious fanatics who have delusions of grandeur generally do not go well. The alternative we've chosen is to not understand their religion, their fanaticism, and their delusions. Instead of negotiations that don't go well, we shrug our shoulders and say, they're crazy. But that's absolutely wrong-headed. We must understand these things. I'm not saying that because I'm a soft-headed pacifist, the FBI doesn't hire agents like that, but because I know understanding such things is the best way to discover the other side's vulnerabilities and wants and thereby gain influence. You can't get that stuff unless you talk. No one is immune to their crazy. You can see it rear its head in every kind of negotiation, from parenting to congressional deal-making to corporate bargaining. But the moment when we're most ready to throw our hands up and declare they're crazy, is often the best moment for discovering black swans that transform a negotiation. It is when we hear or see something that doesn't make sense something crazy that a crucial fork in the road is presented, push forward, even more forcefully, into that which we initially can't process. Or take the other path, the one to guaranteed failure, in which we tell ourselves that negotiating was useless anyway. In their great book Negotiation Genius, four Harvard Business School professors Deepak Malhotra and Max H. Bosserman provide a look at the common reasons negotiators mistakenly call their counterparts crazy. I'd like to talk through them here. Mistake number one. They are ill-informed often the other side is acting on bad information, and when people have bad information they make bad choices. There's a great computer industry term for this. Guy go garbage in, garbage out. As an example, Mel Hopper talks about a student of his who was in a dispute with an ex-employee who claimed he was owed $130,000 in commissions for work he had done before being fired, he was threatening a lawsuit. Confused, the executive turned to the company's accountants. There he discovered the problem. The accounts had been a mess when the employee was fired, but had since been put into order. With the clean information, the accountants assured the executive that in fact the employee owed the company $25,000. Eager to avoid a lawsuit, the executive called the employee, explained the situation, and made an offer. If the employee dropped the lawsuit he could keep the $25,000. To his surprise, the employee said that he was going forward with the suit anyway, he acted irrational, crazy. Malhotra told his student that the problem was not craziness, but a lack of information and trust. So the executive had an outside accounting firm audit the numbers and send the results to the employee. The result? The employee dropped the suit. The clear point here is that people operating with incomplete information appear crazy to those who have different information. Your job when faced with someone like this in a negotiation is to discover what they do not know and supply that information. Mistake number two. They are constrained in any negotiation where your counterpart is acting wobbly. There exists a distinct possibility that they have things they can do but aren't eager to reveal. Such constraints can make the sanest counterpart seem irrational. The other side might not be able to do something because of legal advice, or because of promises already made, or even to avoid setting a precedent. Or they may just not have the power to close the deal. That last situation is one that a client of mine faced as he was trying to land Coca-Cola as a client for his marketing firm. The guy had been negotiating a deal for months and it was getting on to November. He was petrified that if he didn't close it before the calendar year ended, he would have to wait for Coca-Cola to set a new budget, and he might lose the client. The problem was that his contact had suddenly stopped responding. So we told him to send a version of our classic email for non-responders, the one that always works. Have you given up on finalizing this deal this year? Then something weird happened. The Coca-Cola contact didn't respond to the perfect email. What was up? This was superficially quite irrational, but the contact had been a straight-up guy until then. 
We told our client this could mean only one thing, that the guy had given up on closing the deal by the end of the year, but he didn't want to admit it. There had to be some constraint. With this knowledge in hand, we had our client dig deep. After a batch of phone calls and emails he tracked down someone who knew his contact. And it turned out we had been right. The contacts division had been in chaos for weeks, and in the midst of corporate infighting, he had completely lost influence. Not surprisingly, he was embarrassed to admit it. That's why he was avoiding my client. To put it simply, he had major constraints. Mistake number three. They have other interests think back to William Griffin, the first man ever to kill a hostage on deadline. What the FBI and police negotiators on the scene simply did not know was that his main interest was non-negotiating a deal to release the hostages for money. He wanted to be killed by a cop. Had they been able to dig up that hidden interest, they might have been able to avoid some of that day's tragedy. The presence of hidden interests isn't as rare as you might think. Your counterpart will often reject offers for reasons that have nothing to do with their merits. A client may put off buying your product so that their calendar year closes before the invoice hits, increasing his chance for a promotion. Or an employee might quit in the middle of a career-making project just before bonus season because he or she has learned the colleagues are making more money. For that employee, fairness is as much an interest as money. Whatever the specifics of the situation, these people are not acting irrationally. They are simply complying with needs and desires that you don't yet understand what the world looks like to them based on their own set of rules. Your job is to bring these black swans to light. As we've seen, when you recognize that your counterpart is not irrational, but simply ill-informed, constrained, or obeying interests that you do not yet know, your field of movement greatly expands. And that allows you to negotiate much more effectively. Here are a few ways to unearth these powerful black swans, Get FaceTime black swans are incredibly hard to uncover if you're not literally at the table. No matter how much research you do, there's just some information that you are not going to find out unless you sit face to face. Today, a lot of younger people do almost everything over email. It's just how things are done. But it's very difficult to find black swans with email for the simple reason that, even if you knock your counterpart off their moorings with great labels and calibrated questions, Email gives them too much time to think and recenter themselves to avoid revealing too much. In addition, email doesn't allow for tone of voice effects, and it doesn't let you read the nonverbal parts of your counterpart's response, remember 73855. Let's return now to the tale of my client who was trying to get Coca-Cola as a client, only to learn that his contact at the company had been pushed aside. I realized that the only way my client was going to get a deal with Coca-Cola was by getting his contact to admit that he was useless for the situation and pass my client on to the correct executive. But there was no way this guy wanted to do that because he still imagined that he could be important. So I told my client to get his contact out of the Coca-Cola complex. You got to get him to dinner. You're going to say, would it be a bad idea for me to take you to your favorite steakhouse and we just have a few laughs and we don't talk business? The idea was that no matter the reason whether the contact was embarrassed or didn't like my client or just didn't want to discuss the situation, the only way the process was going to move forward was through direct human interaction. So my client got this guy out for dinner and as promised he didn't bring up business. But there was no way not to talk about it and just because my client created personal face-to-face -face interaction, the contact admitted he was the wrong guy. He admitted that his division was a mess and he'd have to hand things off to somebody else to get the deal done. And he did. It took more than a year to get the deal signed, but they did it. Observe unguarded moments while you have to get face time, formal business meetings, structured encounters, and planned negotiating sessions are often the least revealing kinds of face time because these are the moments when people are at their most guarded. Hunting for black swans is also effective during unguarded moments at the fringes, whether at meals like my client had with his Coca-Cola contact, or the brief moments of relaxation before or after formal interactions. During a typical business meeting, the first few minutes, before you actually get down to business, and the last few moments, as everyone is leaving, often tell you more about the other side than anything in between. That's why reporters have a credo to never turn off their recorders, you always get the best stuff at the beginning and the end of an interview. Also pay close attention to your counterpart during interruptions, odd exchanges, or anything that interrupts the flow. When someone breaks ranks, people's facades crack just a little. Simply noticing whose cracks and how others respond verbally and non-verbally can reveal a gold mine.
When it doesn't make sense, there's sense to be made. Students often ask me whether black swans are specific kinds of information or any kind that helps. I always answer that they are anything that you don't know that changes things. To drive this home, here's the story of one of my MBA students who was interning for a private equity real estate firm in Washington. Faced with actions from his counterpart that didn't pass the sense test, he innocently turned up one of the greatest black swans I've seen in years by using a label. My student had been performing due diligence on potential targets when a principal at the firm asked him to look into a mixed-use property in the heart of Charleston, South Carolina. He had no experience in the Charleston market, so he called the broker selling the property and requested the marketing package. After discussing the deal in the market, my student and his boss decided that the asking price of $4.3 million was about $450,000 too high. At that point, my student called the broker again to discuss pricing and next steps. After initial pleasantries, the broker asked my student what he thought of the property. It looks like an interesting property, he said. Unfortunately, we don't know the market fundamentals. We like downtown and King Street in particular, but we have a lot of questions. The broker then told him that he had been in the market for more than 15 years, so he was well informed. At this point, my student pivoted to calibrated how and what questions in order to gather information and judge the broker's skills. Great, my student said. First and foremost, how has Charleston been affected by the economic downturn? The broker replied with a detailed answer, citing specific examples of market improvement. In the process, he showed my student that he was very knowledgeable. It sounds like I'm in good hands, he said, using a label to build empathy. Next question. What sort of cap rate can be expected in this type of building? Through the ensuing back and forth, my student learned that owners could expect rates of 6 to 7 percent because buildings like this were popular with students at the local university, a growing school where 60 percent of the student body lived off campus. He also learned that it would be prohibitively expensive if not physically impossible to buy land nearby and build a similar building. In the last five years no one had built on the street because of historic preservation rules. Even if they could buy land, the broker said a similar building would cost $2.5 million just in construction. The building is in great shape, especially compared to the other options available to students, the broker said. It seems like this building functions more as a glorified dormitory than a classic multifamily building, my student said, using a label to extract more information. And he got it. Fortunately and unfortunately, yes, the broker said, the occupancy has historically been 100% and it is a cash cow, but the students act like college students. A light bulb went on in my student's head, there was something strange afoot. If it were such a cash cow, why would someone sell a 100% occupied building located next to a growing campus in an affluent city? That was irrational by any measure. A little befuddled but still in the negotiation mince it, my student constructed a label. Inadvertently he mislabeled the situation, triggering the broker to correct him and reveal a black swan. If he or she is selling such a cash cow, it seems like the seller must have doubts about future market fundamentals, he said. Well, he said, the seller has some tougher properties in Atlanta and Savannah, so he has to get out of this property to pay back the other mortgages. Bingo! With that, my student had unearthed a fantastic black swan. The seller was suffering constraints that, until that moment, had been unknown. My student put the broker on mute as he described other properties and used the moment to discuss pricing with his boss. He quickly gave him the green light to make a lowball offer and extreme anchor to try to yank the broker to his minimum. After quizzing the broker if the seller would be willing to close quickly and getting yes my student said his anchor. I think I have heard enough he said. We are willing to offer $3.4 million. Okay, the broker answered. That is well below the asking price. However, I can bring the offer to the seller and see what he thinks. Later that day, the broker came back with a counter offer. The seller had told him that the number was too low, but he was willing to take $3.7 million. My student could barely keep from falling off his chair. The counter offer was lower than his goal. But rather than jump at the amount and risk leaving value on the table with a wimp win deal, my student pushed further. He said no without using the word. That is closer to what we believe the value to be, he said, but we cannot in good conscience pay more than $3.55 million. Later, my student told me and I agreed that he should have used a label or calibrated question here to push the broker to bid against himself. But he was so surprised by how far the price had dropped that he stumbled into old shul haggling. 
I am only authorized to go down to $3.6 million, the broker answered, clearly showing that he never taken a negotiation class that taught the Ackerman model and how to pivot to terms to avoid the haggle. My student's boss signaled to him that $3.6 million worked and he agreed to the price. I teased several of the techniques my student used to effectively negotiate a great deal for his firm, from the use of labels and calibrated questions to the probing of constraints to unearth a beautiful black swan. It also bears noting that my student did tons of work beforehand and had prepared labels and questions so that he was ready to jump on the black swan when the broker offered it. Once he knew that the seller was trying to get money out of this building to pay off mortgages on the underperforming ones, he knew that timing was important. Of course, there's always room for improvement. Afterward my student told me he wished he hadn't lowballed the offer so quickly and instead used the opportunity to discuss the other properties. He might have found more investment opportunities within the seller's portfolio. In addition, he could have potentially built more empathy and teased out more unknown unknowns with labels or calibrated questions like what markets are you finding difficult right now, maybe even gotten face time with the seller directly. Still, well done. Overcoming fear and learning to get what you want out of life people generally fear conflict, so they avoid useful arguments out of fear that the tone will escalate into personal attacks they cannot handle. People in close relationships often avoid making their own interests known and instead compromise across the board to avoid being perceived as greedy or self-interested. They fold, they grow bitter, and they grow apart. We've all heard of marriages that ended in divorce and the couple never fought. Families are just an extreme version of all parts of humanity, from government to business. Except for a few naturals, everyone hates negotiation at first, your hands sweat, your fight-or-flight kicks in, with a strong emphasis on flight, and your thoughts trip drunkenly over themselves. The natural first impulse for most of us is to chicken out, throw in the towel, run. The mere idea of tossing out an extreme anchor is traumatic. That's why wimp-win deals are the norm in the kitchen and in the boardroom. But stop and think about that. Are we really afraid of the guy across the table? I can promise you that, with very few exceptions, he's not going to reach across and slug you. No, our sweaty palms are just an expression of physiological fear, a few trigger-happy neurons firing because of something more base. Our innate human desire to get along with other members of the tribe. It's not the guy across the table who scares us. It's conflict itself. If this book accomplishes only one thing, I hope it gets you over that fear of conflict and encourages you to navigate it with empathy. If you're going to be great at anything, a great negotiator, a great manager, a great husband, a great wife, you're going to have to do that. You're going to have to ignore that little genie who's telling you to give up, to just get along as well as that other genie who's telling you to lash out and yell. You're going to have to embrace regular thoughtful conflict as the basis of effective negotiation and of life. Please remember that our emphasis throughout the book is that the adversary is the situation and that the person that you appear to be in conflict with is actually your partner. More than a little research has shown that genuine honest conflict between people over their goals actually helps energize the problem-solving process in a collaborative way. Skilled negotiators have a talent for using conflict to keep the negotiation going without stumbling into a personal battle. Remember, pushing hard for what you believe is not selfish. It is not bullying. It is not just helping you. Your amygdala, the part of the brain that processes fear, will try to convince you to give up, to flee, because the other guy is right, or you're being cruel, but if you are an honest decent person looking for a reasonable outcome, you can ignore the amygdala. With the style of negotiation taught in the book and information-obsessed empathic search for the best possible deal you are trying to uncover value, period. Not a strong armor to humiliate. When you ask calibrated questions, yes, you are leading your counterpart to your goals. But you are also leading them to examine and articulate what they want and why and how they can achieve it. You are demanding creativity of them and therefore pushing them toward a collaborative solution. When I bought my Red 4 Runner, no doubt I disappointed the salesman by giving him a smaller payday than he would have liked. But I helped him reach his quota and no doubt I paid more for the truck than the car lot at Pay Toyota. If all I'd wanted was to win to humiliate, I would have stolen the thing. And so I'm going to leave you with one request. Whether it's in the office or around the family dinner table, don't avoid honest clear conflict. It will get you the best car price, the higher salary, and the largest donation. It will also save your marriage, your friendship, and your family. 
one can only be an exceptional negotiator and a great person by both listening and speaking clearly and empathetically, by treating counterparts and oneself with dignity and respect, and most of all by being honest about what one wants and what one can and cannot do. Every negotiation, every conversation, every moment of life is a series of small conflicts that, managed well, can rise to creative beauty. Embrace them. Key lessons what we don't know can kill us or our deals. But uncovering it can totally change the course of a negotiation and bring us unexpected success. Finding the black swans those powerful unknown unknowns is intrinsically difficult, however, for the simple reason that we don't know the questions to ask. Because we don't know what the treasure is, we don't know where to dig. Here are some of the best techniques for flushing out the black swans and exploiting them. Remember, your counterpart might not even know how important the information is, or even that they shouldn't reveal it. So keep pushing, probing, and gathering information. Let what you know your known knowns guide you but not blind you. Every case is new, so remain flexible and adaptable. Remember the Griffin Bank crisis. No hostage taker had killed a hostage on deadline, until he did. Black swans are leverage multipliers. Remember the three types of leverage. Positive, the ability to give someone what they want, negative, the ability to hurt someone, and normative, using your counterpart's norms to bring them around. Work to understand the other side's religion. Digging into worldviews inherently implies moving beyond the negotiating table and into the life, emotional and otherwise, of your counterpart. That's where black swans live. Review everything you hear from your counterpart. You will not hear everything the first time, so double-check. Compare notes with team members. Use backup listeners whose job is to listen between the lines. They will hear things you miss. Exploit the similarity principle. People are more apt to concede to someone they share a cultural similarity with, so dig for what makes them tick and show that you share common ground. When someone seems irrational or crazy, they most likely aren't. Faced with this situation, search for constraints, hidden desires, and bad information. Get face time with your counterpart. Ten minutes of face time often reveals more than days of research. Pay special attention to your counterpart's verbal and nonverbal communication at unguarded moments at the beginning and the end of the session, or when someone says something out of line. Acknowledgements this book would not have been possible without my son Brandon's help. Brandon has been involved in helping me shape and create these ideas since I first began teaching at Georgetown University. He was initially just there to video record the classes, but he also provided me feedback on how it was going and what was working. To be fair, he actually has been negotiating with me since he was two years old. I think I've known that ever since I found out he was using empathy to get out of trouble with his vice principal in high school. In my first meeting with my brilliant cowrider, Tal Roz, Brandon was there to keep the information flow going as Tal soaked it up. In the first progress conference call with my amazing publisher, Hollis Heimbich, Hollis asked about Brandon's role, and Tal said having Brandon around was like having another Chris in the room. Brandon has been indispensable. Tal Roz is a flat-out genius. Anyone who writes a business book without him hasn't gotten as far as they could have. It's that simple. I can't believe how smart he is or how quickly he gets it. He is a true business writing artist. He's a great person as well. Steve Ross, my agent, is a man of integrity and was perfect for this book. He has great industry knowledge and made this book happen. I am grateful to know him. Hollis Heimbach rocks. I am thrilled that she led the HarperCollins team and believed enough in this book to buy it. Thank you, Hollis. Thank you, Maya Stevenson, for coming onto the Black Swan team and holding us together. We are going farther because of you. Sheila Heen and John Richardson are two amazing people. They are the ones who really paved the way to show that these hostage negotiation ideas belong in the business world. Sheila was my teacher at Harvard Law School. She inspired me with how she taught and who she is. She asked me to teach alongside her two years later. John asked me to teach international business negotiation at Harvard alongside him a year after that. He guided me through that process, which led to the opportunity to become an adjunct at Georgetown. When nothing was happening for me, both John and Sheila were there. Without them I don't know where I'd be. Thank you both. Gary Nosner was my mentor at the FBI. He inspired and remade the hostage negotiation world with the help of his team at the Crisis Negotiation Unit CNU. He supported me in whatever I wanted to do. He made me the FBI's lead international kidnapping negotiator. I could call Gary at 5 a.m. and tell him I was getting on a plane in three hours to go to a kidnapping, and he would say, go. His support never wavered. 
At CNU he pulled together the most talented collection of hostage negotiators ever assembled. CNU hit its zenith when we were there. None of us knew how lucky we were. John Flood, Vince D'Alfonso, Chuck Regini, Winnie Miller, Manny Suarez, Dennis Braden, Neil Pertel, and Steve Romano were all rock stars. I learned from you all. I can't believe what Chuck put up with from me as my partner. Dennis was a mentor and great friend. I constantly clashed with Vince and grew because of his talent. All those who were on the FBI critical incident negotiation team during that time taught me as well. Thank you. Tommy Corrigan and John Laguori were my brothers when I was in New York City. The three of us did extraordinary things together. I am inspired by the memory of Tommy Corrigan to this day. I was privileged to be a member of the Joint Terrorist Task Force. We fought evil. Richie DiFilippo and Charlie Bodoin were exceptional wingmen on the crisis negotiation team. Thank you both for all you taught me. Hugh McGowan and Bob Loudon from the NYPD's hostage negotiation team share their wisdom with me. Both of you have been indispensable assets to the hostage negotiation world. Thank you. Derek Gaunt has been a great wingman in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Derek gets it. Thank you, Derek. Kathy Ellingsworth and her late husband, Bill, have been dear friends and a sounding board for years. I am grateful for your support and friendship. Tom Strentz is the godfather of the FBI's hostage crisis negotiation program and has been an unwavering friend. I can't believe he still takes my calls. My students at Georgetown and USC have constantly proved that these ideas work everywhere. More than one student has stopped breathing when I looked at them and said, I need a car in 60 seconds or she dies. Thanks for coming along for the ride. Georgetown and USC have both been phenomenal places to teach. Both are truly dedicated to higher learning, the highest academic standards, and the success of their students. The hostages and their families who allow me in during their darkest hours to try to help are all blessed people. I am grateful to still be in touch with some of you today. What wisdom there is in the universe that decided your paths were necessary, I don't understand. I was blessed by your grace. I need all the help I can get.